Give onks and praise. Give onks and praise. All right. Ank and my op. Ank and my op, family. We are live. We are live with, yeah, thanks. with Sesh Nasut, Sanjeti, and everyone's favorite, who we love so much, Baba Haru, Ank Ross, Imaj Se Prata. Tuesday Talk family, you know what? Sanjeti and Baba Haru are two of my favorite people in the comedic community. You know why? Because they are so forth giving with the knowledge that they have. And it's so much fun to just sit and listen and learn and absorb and be a little bit overwhelmed <laughs> with all of the information that they have and that they share. And, and I just love it. And it's one of the reasons that I, that I started Tuesday Talk because I wanted to be around those people who knew all of this information and who share. As you're coming in, you know the drill. Let us know where you are and where you're coming in from so we can see and understand and appreciate the reach that we have with Tuesday Talk and how this information is being disseminated to those of us who need it. And that's all of us, right? Everyone should have this information. Tonight, we are going to be discussing the 42 laws of Ma'at. And we have our shrine elder, who is everyone's elder in this legacy, who also gave us another set of 42 to help us use, the, use these in our modern times, okay? Based upon the same principles, but being able to be used for modern times. And we have Seshma Such Sanjeti, scribe Sanjeti. So those of you who know him know we're going to get some Medu Nature tonight. Tonight is going to be very powerful. One of the things that I ask everyone in the Tuesday talk listening realm is to make sure that you support and financially support people who are the best out here in their respective space. Okay. And years from now, you're going to realize who you had on Tuesday talk. We need to support people who are doing this work today so that we can continue to do it tomorrow. Throughout tonight, Baba Haru's cash app will be posted. Sanjeti's cash app will be posted. And we want to make sure that you show your love and appreciation in a, in a monetary way. Okay, we do it for everybody else. And we have to make sure that we understand it's important to do that for ourselves and more important to do that for ourselves so that we can, through collective work, recreate our and benefit from our financial prowess because we are a strong financially, financial prowess base. If we weren't, we wouldn't see businesses in our communities. Okay, so I just want to put that bug in your ear. We all have a responsibility to see this grow. Okay, and with these two people, does it get any better, people? Come on, it does not. All right, let's see where everybody is checking in from with that with that uh, preposition at the end. My mom was an English teacher, so I'm committing a little grammar fraction. <laughs> Bob is getting a call. We've got Sakina Ra. My aunt, my aunt, right now. <laughs> Baba has a call. Just leave that alone. Um, tomorrow, on your way in, bring it back, okay? Him. Yeah, bring those tomorrow on your way in, okay? <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to mute Baba so we can have some privacy on the phone. And what? Ay, ay, ay. A half an inch longer. Yeah, and, yeah, and as wide as the other. There we go. So Baba can have a little privacy when he's on the phone. So we are checking in to see where the family is tonight. And looks like Baba is back. So let me unmute Baba. One second, Baba, I'm going to unmute you. Unmute. 
Baba, you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Baba is back. So we know Baba is in the studio that is in Chinatown in New York City. We have Nahesi999 in Las Vegas. Shahid Douglas, Uncle, Uncle, Uncle Jasaneb to you. Sandra is in New York. Sandra or Sandra is right here in New York City. Pam Smith is in Massachusetts. We've got Jason in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is awesome, you guys. Ankama Atsin Curtis, member of the Shrine. He's in. Ja he's from Jackson, from Painesville via Pittsburgh. Tehuti Films, Ankama Ad. All right, we have a lot of people here. I see Chicago's in the house. Ankama Ad Baba, everybody's showing you some love. Goodbye, thank Sandra. you, thank you for, for joining us for Tuesday Talk today. I'm so excited to have these two. The synergy of working with Baba Haru and S S Scribe Sanjeti is just amazing. But Baba, we want to talk to you first. We want to just hear what you have to say about the 42 laws of Ma'at and why it's so important that we know the 42 that we live the 42 and that we eventually and ultimately embody the 42. What are the 42 laws of Ma'at and why was it important for you to give us this new covenant of the 42 laws of Ma'at? Well, um, first and foremost, Dua Anke Ma'at to everyone. Um, as you know, the reclamation of this culture is not exactly a walk in the park because it demands that we align ourselves not just with the information but with applying the informa applying the information into a practice That's i remember when i first started i got a lot of pushback for seeking to restart up this energy of maat again um, they thought that uh, it was just enough to go to lectures and have these feel-good moments about our belongership to the culture of ancient Egypt, as they called it. But I realized that if you're going to put what your ancestors left into practice, the first thing you are required to do in, in the reclamation of this uh, spiritual sacred science is to gird yourself with by claiming, by reclaiming the confessions of Ma'at, because this is the ethical code by which our ancestors lived. And so uh, there were many of them um, scattered in different papyri throughout um, our story. But the That's one right. that comes down most to us today is the papyrus of Anui, also called Ani. And, um, and those, uh, those 42 confessions uh, is an ancestral gift that we do not touch. We do not disturb them. They remain inviolate. And we also claim those 42. But since we have been um, turned, our culture has been turned around here in Amenta, the West, um, we have acquired some bad habits, I would say, from those who have enslaved our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And um, we have flirted with ancestral treason by not recognizing that we had a culture long before another one was imposed upon us by the people of the ice and sand. And so realizing this as a keeper of the elder shrine here in Amenta, the shrine of Ptah, which has been established over 50 years ago. Um, or at least the work of the shrine was established over 50 years ago and more formally entered later on. But we realized that we needed to address the great brain stain that many of us have suffered from. Uh, they call it brainwashing, but I've always said to wash something is to clean it. Our brains have been stained by the wrong information we have become addicted to belief, even though the book that most of us was brought up on tell us that 
my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And I want to emphasize that because surely we have a lot of belief, um, but little knowledge. And so we decided to, I decided to spare ahead the application of these 42 Nuka Venants of Mayat. And it was just not my doing. I solicited the input of various shrine keepers, shrine members, and um, temple keepers. In here you will find uh, the gifts um, given to us by the Temple of Anu. If I'm not mistaken, Brother Sanjedi had something to say about these likewise. And even some of our detractors um, up in the conscious community in Harlem, uh, who now has a problem with us wearing white, made a contribution to the 42 New Covenants of my art. So I would like to, um, I would like to just say that tonight we're going to highlight specific ones, but before I begin that, let's begin with the ancestral gift of the 42 Covenants of Ma'at, which is going to be presented by um, Seshur San Sanjeti. So now I toss it over to you, my beloved brother. Can you hear me? Okay. All right, yep, just uh, find my unmute button. All right, Dua'u, um, Baba Haru, Ankema'at, uh, us, to you. And this, that is how we give respect to our priests of the comedic legacy in our re in, in this modern day where we're reconstructing it using African um, We give respect and honor to all African traditions. Uh, you know, there's no competition you know because there's this thing where you know people say oh y'all not y'all not from egypt y'all you know it's it's silliness and uh very divisive and in the spirit of shaking to jump shaking to diop the culture unity of black africa so you know when we, when we look at kemet we're looking at um of course an ancient african civilization in which we still have records for and we can use that to help us with comparisons to weed out the influences of the Abrahamic traditions. Because see, once the Abrahamic traditions come into play, things start to get mixed. So how do we differentiate? Well, what part of, you know, say Yoruba culture is influenced by um, Islam, okay? That may have made its way into the spiritual practices. How do we weed that out? We look at other uh, cultures in West Africa, Central, South Africa, but mostly, you know, North and West Africa, Central Africa and East. How do we find out, well, what's characteristically African of that culture without Christianity and Islam? One of the ways that we can do that is you use comparisons. You find out what the mother tongue is, what the mother culture is, find records in which, again, we have Kemet. To help us with that, you do the comparisons and that helps us. Now, that's not end all be all because there's other things that you can do. You can compare, let's say, the Akon tradition with, say, Sheshe Lake Ba, find out what they have in common. You that's could right. do that with traditions in Central Africa, find out what they have in common. Um, the Sangoma tradition in South Africa, find out what they have in common. Um, you know, let's say, uh, with some cultures in Central Africa or in the Congo. You can look at traditions uh, coming out of Benin, you know, the Voodoo tradition, which later becomes Voodoo, okay, when it comes over to the Caribbean, South America, Central, and North America. You know, find out what those commonalities are. So, you know, here, you know, we, we discuss, okay, what is the basis of the 42? What is that basis? Uh, you know, my conversation is going to be, all right, you want to look at the title of Pertum Haru, give you give you a really a surface intro um, or contribute to the intro because most of us were familiar with it. So we may come at it from a slightly different angle. Uh, I'm not going to go real heavy into all of the 42. You know, I'm going to pinpoint one specific one that will encompass um, the rest of them. 
because we're going to have more conversations on this. Because if it went through all the 42, we'll be here for four, five hours. That's for sure. So, yeah. So it's so, okay. Let, let's shave it down. We're going to focus <laughs> on, um, I'm going to give you one specific one. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, we'll give a little bit of language. You can't have me without a little bit of language. Uh, and then Barbara, and then after that, then we're going to hand it over to Barbara Rue. And she's going to talk about uh, the new covenants. Uh, which is a 42 uh, uh, declarations of innocence, or really just saying, I shall not, or I have not, et cetera, up to today's time and how how we adapt for today. So that this is part of the ancient legacy to the living legacy, this slogan that we use in the Temple of Manor. Okay. All right. So, so how you like that, Sister Sushat? Man, this is easy because I'm sitting here with both of you. I know that you guys have it. I, it's it, that was great. That was perfect. You know, letting letting everyone know we're not going to deep dive into all 42. But part of what Tuesday Talk is is it teaches you how to do your own research and kind of learn. And when you're in this legacy, we need instructions on how to find and learn um, on our own. So. When, uh, when Sanjeti takes these, these 42 and does the deep dive and when Baba does his explanation, that gives you a, a, like a platform or like an outline, if you will, of how you can continue looking at the rest of the 42 to do that for your own, for, your, you know, for yourself, on your own rather, for yourself. Or maybe like you're with three people, the three of you guys get together and say, hey, let's go through this. Let's spend them two months to do this. And we just go over them and we look at it you know, wide and deep the way Sanjeti showed us and also with the explanation the way Baba showed us. So I think that that's great. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and pull up this. Uh, the screen share. Present. How's everybody doing out there? All right, Let's see people in the chat. Let's do share screen. Okay. Let me know when you can see the screen. Oh, sorry. Hold on. So, chat, can you see the screen? It's, yep. Okay, everybody can see the screen. All right, good. Yeah, because I can't see anybody, just the presentation. Okay, so when Baba Haru, um, Akwa Samaj, and myself, when we get together, we like to call it the craftsman and the scribe. So the first time we, we collaborated and, and had a, a talk, it, it was with Tahuti Films. Uh, so, you know, when one day y'all get to see that, that footage, it was a few years ago. Uh, you know, and that was uh, ran and sponsored by our brother Heru Seed um, and his wife Akhmarie. A very powerful discussion, and we talked about the Papas Ani and Perthram Heru. So we we'll call this the, the Craftsman and the Scribe too. So this is our second uh, uh, recording of us dialoguing together, just sharing. All right. So the respective temples. So we have the Temple of Anu .org. Make sure you visit. Uh, you have the Shrine of Ptah, headed by uh, our elder, Hera Akrasama Sapata. Then we have uh, the Shrine of Ma'at, uh, headed by Jabar Sazi and his wife, Nico Sazi. All right. So, all right, so let's get straight into it. So when we talk about the Pertim Heru, we know that Egyptologists may call it the Egyptian Book of the Dead. We know we don't call it that. So we know that the translation is, it translates to the book of coming forth by day, right? So that is the popular translation that we have. But, you know, when we get into some re-evaluations and we, and we tweak it a little bit, we may, may come up with some really significant uh, uh, darts and bullet points to come away with. So we look on the left here, you see this sign here, see the R, so that's red. 
So that's a mouth. That is a human mouth. For those of you who have taken uh, Meru Nature from myself, Dr. Kiriyama, and Fidishi Juhudimas, um, even from uh, 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 Sebat Anika, uh, Bujal, many others, you know that that is the R phonogram, a human mouth. So, and we know that we have in comedic writing system, they primarily write consonants. Uh, very rarely will you find vowels. So words are written without the vowels, but they share that common consonant. Why is that? That is because you have people speaking different dialects, different languages, but have the same words, but they're pronounced slightly different. So in order to uh, solve that problem, just use the consonants because the consonant is the skeleton. We all share the same skeleton, the basic DNA. So that's what that is about. So you have these two different words. At the top, you see um, Ray, meaning speech, utterance, language. And then beneath that, you have another word written the same, but it has a different meaning, chapter or section, section of a book. And then beneath that, you'll, you see the translation, Ray, meaning chapter. In the singular, next to it, you have the plural. So that's, we would say Ru or Rewa, actually, Rewa. But most of the people say Ru, so that's fine for right now, meaning chapters or sections. But now we, we could do with some paronymy here. Paronymy is, it occurs when there's two words that sound or are spelt the same or similar, but have different meanings, but yet are combined into a grand theme. So the reason why I retranslated it as utterance chapters is because these are, as people might call them, spells, if you will. You're supposed to utter them. You recite them. That's where that speech utterance comes from, at that definition at the top. But yet these are chapters at the same time. So I've translated it as utterance chapters because both are true at the same time. The utterance chapters were going forth into the day. So let's continue with our translation here. So the next one is of. So that's your new. New, which is actually the plural. So the singular is ne. But since we're talking about chapters, or utterance chapters, you have to say new or new way of, and it agrees with the plural noun that precedes it. You're getting a little bit of grammar lessons here. So utterance chapters for going forth into the day or of going forth into the day. Let's keep going. What's the next one? Going forth. So going forth is what? It comes from the word um, uh, pero or parota, parot, because in the singular is pero. You can see the determinative sign. It's that last one at the bottom right. These are moving feet. These are legs. So this implies a movement, a development, going forward, coming forth, or emerging, emerging. Anyone who's familiar with uh, the dating system, the timekeeping and timid, we know that the second season is called Predat. Predat which is the season of emerging or the, or the growing season, okay? All right. I kind of hear it's a little choppy in the background there. Okay. You know, I don't, I don't know how to stop that. Um, okay. I can mute myself. Maybe if we mute ourselves. All is right. it bad, Sanjeti? A little bit. Oh, man. <laughs> all right. Okay. It's, it's okay. That's all right. All right, let's keep going. So the next term we have into. So that's ma or m, if you will. So that's the owl. For those, you know, again, those of you taking Meta Nature, you're familiar with this. It means into, within, by means of. So this is into, going into the day. Next one, Haru. So that is day, daytime, or even daylight, if you will. So Here's what we have. We put it all together. You have ru nu per tem heru. Uh, some will put the at, um, adage on there, em ger, per tem heru, em ger. Uh, so book of coming forth by day. 
Others translate it as book of going forth into the daytime or daylight. Or we can expand it a little bit more to, to give us a stronger, deeper feel for what the text is about. It's the utterance chapters for emerging forth into the daylight. Why? Because you have, as an ancestor, gone through the trials and tribulations that occurred during the nighttime and you emerge triumphantly into the daylight to, to become one with Ra. So that is the context of the daytime, the daylight. And this is why I translated it this way, because while looking at the culture, there's always this desire to merge with light as you go through your ancestralization process from the pyramid text, coffin text, all the way to Perth and Haru, which essentially is uh, a lineage text, lineage text, the ancestor of the Pertum Haru is the coffin text, is the pyramid text. So, and even going to the pyramid text, it will speak about merging with the light of stars. When you go to the coffin text, it's all about the merging with the light of stars and merging with the light of the sun. And here you talk about merging with the light of the sun primarily. And this is after you have been judged righteous by the great judge, the Netra Ai, the great, as it called, the great God, if you will, in translations, the great Netra, um, Wasari or Osar, if you will. So that is why um, I translated it as daylight, because you are merging with the light of stars, you're merging with the light of the moon, merging with the light of the sun. So now let, let's let's go into the Papsaani, but this here is 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 a general going into the Papsaani general about what the Pertum here was about, and specifically um, uh, the practice of Ani or Anui, if you will. So on the right, you see the scribe Anui and his wife uh, Tutu. So. You can you can say it's the purpose of, of Anui and Tutu, if you will, primarily him, but he's not doing it alone. He's bringing his wife with him because they work together through their lifetime so that if he deserves it, she deserves and has earned the afterlife to be judged righteous. So it says this. The man Anui and his wife Tutu are depicted on this famous document going through the ancestorization process. <clears throat> uh, the author Wasserman, he says this, and this, these are his words. Ani was a scribe and temple accountant, an upper middle class member of an extensive Egyptian religious and political bureaucracy. His papyrus would be uniquely personal created from a collection of ancient spells dating back over a thousand years before he was born. Originally carved onto the stone walls of the Pharaoh's tomb, pyramid text, and who those pyramid texts belong to. This, the pyramid text of Wanasa or Unas, if you will. The pyramid text of Teti, the pyramid text of uh, uh, Pepe, Pepe II, or Nefakara Pepe. So Nefakara Pepe is Pepe II. Myrna Ra, and many others. And this goes back into those early dynasties, the fifth dynasty, sixth dynasty. These prayers and litanies have evolved to wider distribution a uh, centuries uh, earlier when they were painted on the sides of wooden coffins for wealthy nobles of the realm. So this is your coffin text. So you have the pyramid text and then people began to expand and add to them and it became more accessible to people. So now it goes to the nobles and people who have a little bit more money to, and to pay for these things. So this, we have the coffin text, if you will, or the book of Ma'akaru. So the coffin text literally is called the book of Ma'akaru. All right. By Ani's time or Anui, circa 1250 BCE, the ancient spells were written and illustrated on rolls of papyri Buried with the deceased, or what they call the books of the dead, beginning about 1550 BCE. So Ani believed that after his and his wife Tutu's deaths, this collection of paper, uh, prayers, hymns, uh, that she used to say hymns, and spells would aid their spirits to be successful in the trials of the underworld or the duat, 
that they would then be free to soar through the celestial realms of the Egyptian afterlife. 2014 Watchmen, pages 10 through 11. So this here gives us the gives us a uh, uh, like a context of what becomes Pertum Heru. So at the top you see PMH, that's short for Pertum Heru. So these are the selected chapters of the Pertum Heru. The Pertum Heru as a as a complete corpus is closer to 200 chapters or or individual spell, if you will. More like 1, 198, 199 around there. So the so the chapters that you find on the Paps of Anui are selected chapters, not necessarily in numerical order, if you will. So the Paps of Anui has 69 chapters out of the near 200 that are actually available. So of the 69 chapters, we'll just take a look at um, the chapters as emboldened in red. So you have the hymn to Ra, the hymn to Wasari, that's Asar, um, chapter 30B, and then over to the bottom right, uh, the 125th chapter, we'll take a look at that. So this here is what's called plate or sheet 1A. Why is it called plate or sheet? Because E.A. Wallace Budge, a famous Egyptologist from the 1800, from the uh, 19th century going to the 20th century, he cut the papyrus to make to make it easier for him to transport it. Uh, so that's why it's called sheets, if you will. This is not it was was not categorized that way originally. It was one long papyri. So here, this is the beginning. You see Anui and his wife Tutu. What are they doing? Giving Duau, have their hands up. Duau, because they are what? They're they're praising while they bring offerings. Offerings is very common and staple, a staple in African culture. Offerings, mm -hmm. sacrifice. What you're looking at is a typical African practice where they have um, bread, um, hind legs of oxen, plants, fruits, uh, small trees, etc. You see his wife, Tutu, she's holding uh, a lotus and papyri in her hand, etc. And she has a wax cone on her head uh, there, which is fashionable. Then, all right, let's keep going. So on, this is a smaller uh, uh, view of the same uh, section. So this is what it says. Adoration to Ra when he rises in the eastern horizon of heaven, uh, eastern horizon of the sky, excuse me. So what you see in red here, corresponds to what you see right here, the rubric. The rubric here on the far right-hand side in the upper. So Adoris Ra, when he rises in the eastern horizon of the sky by Wasar or the Asar, because Asar or Wasar is his title now, because he's becoming Wasar. He's becoming that. The scribe of the divine offerings to all of the Neturu, Anui, and he, said, he says, homage to you. So that's that Anujarak. Having come as Kepri. So he's saying to Ra, I'm paying homage to you when you're coming forth as Kepri. The evolutionary, if you will. Um, ever Kepri, who is the creator of the Neturu. You rise and shine on the back of your mother. You appeared in glory, king of the Neturu. Your mother, Newt, shall use her arms on your behalf in making greeting. The man who mountain that receives you in peace. Mott embraces you at all seasons. You know, so, uh, and this this is part of the title. You, you know, that up here where it says, Adoration to Robin, Rising, Eastern Rising, that's the title, powerful title. So that's the first section. Then, now, then we go into uh, sheet 1B through 2A. So you see these images here, and you've perhaps seen at least the Ankh with the uh, with the arms holding the sun, with Nebethet and Aset giving praises on both sides, flanking the jet pillar. And then you have the baboons also jumping up, giving praise to the sun. Baboons actually do that in the morning. That's where we get that from. Mm -hmm. uh, so where does the image come from? It comes from the Pop Sa'ani. Sheet 1B through 2A. 
So on this sheet here, he's giving praise to Wasar. So you start giving praise to Ra. He's also giving praise to Asar. Adoration to Asar, Wu Neferi, the great Netcher, Netcher Ai, who dwells in the Cheni County. So a district, if you will. King of Eternity, Naba of Everlasting. What is Naba? Instead of saying Neb, because we don't translate this as Lord, because that gives it like an English Christian type of connotation, and we want to move away from that. So we leave it untranslated. You can say Neb if you like, that's fine. You can say Naba, you say Neba, Neba of Everlasting, Everlastingness, who passes millions of years in his lifetime, firstborn of Newt, begotten of of Geb, heir, Naba of the Waret crown, who has taken the crook and the flail, the Nkaka. So he's giving praises to the power of Asar. Now we move on to sheet three. So this is the more familiar image that people will associate with the judgment scene. We'll say, here, this is where he's being judged. Well, Kind of, yes, and a little bit more than that. It's a little different, but check this out. This image, remember, this is not the 42 here. This is called the chapter for not letting Anui's heart create opposition against him in the Netra's domain. That So when you see this image, that is the name of the chapter. This is what's happening. But when you actually, when you read the text, it will tell you what's going on. Let's say I want to move something around here. All right. So this is what Anui says, and it starts here. You see, you see the baboon here. Hopefully, you can see my mouse. Can y'all see my mouse moving? Yes, I can see it. Look okay. in the middle, guys. Okay. All right. So right here, you see this red right here. You see this red. So this is where it begins to tell us what he's saying because it'll talk about Anui. Because it's facing the same direction as Anui, which this tells us who's speaking. That's why on this side, you see Jehuti. You see this Ibis bird right here, or the, or the hobby bird? That's Jehuti right here. It's facing the same direction as he is. This tells you that he's speaking. Okay. So right here, Jed Meduin is what it says, which means recitation by the Asar right here. The scribe Anui right here. And it makes it, it makes it more efficient because when you can read the text, you know what's going on. All right. So is Jed F. Jed F means he says. So now he's about to speak. And he says, Oh, Ib E or Ab E. Oh, my heart. Most of you know that the word Ib or Ab means heart. So this right here. And it corresponds to the translation right here. Okay. Oh, my heart, which is which I had from my mother. So he, he he gives praise to his mother here. Oh, my heart, which I had from my mother. Oh, my heart of my different ages. So what does he mean by that? My different ages, the, the development that you've gone through throughout your life. OK, do not stand up as a witness against me. Do not be opposed to me. In the tribunal, that's it should say me in the tribunal. Do not be hostile to me in the presence of the keeper of the balance. Who's the keeper of the balance? Right here. That's uh Ampu or Impua. We may, may pronounce it now Ampua when we use our, our Bantu languages to help us pronounce the terms. Impua. For you are my ka, which was in my body, the protector who made my members hail or my body parts hail. Do not let lie. Do not tell lies about me in the presence of the nature. So what's happening here is Anui is taking his heart. He's, he's being put on a scale and he's speaking to his heart. He's telling his heart, yo, listen, don't be a witness against me. Don't tell lies about me. Okay? You are my heart that came from my mother. That was passed down to me. Meaning the morals and ethics and teachings and spirit from my parents has been passed down to me is what that means. This is this is an interpretation. Oh, my heart, which I have for my mother. Oh, 
my heart of my different ages, meaning you've been with me through all my, my development, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, etc. Do not stand up against me as a witness. So that's what's happening here. And he said, in the tribunal, what's who's the tribunal? Right here. All these witnesses up here at the top, you have the witnesses. You have the recorder, the divine scribe here. Of course, you have Ammon ready to devour. You have the uh, uh, nature net, root, you have nature, etc. You have destiny, you have uh, fortune, etc. all around. So this is not, he's not being judged just yet per se, but yet it's being weighed and he's speaking to his own heart because your own heart is your mind, your memories. Okay, let's go to the next. All right, now we're going to jump to sheet 31. There's many sheets, if you will, 69 chapters. So we're jumping to sheet 31, where you have what's called the 42 Declarations of Innocence, if you will. In the past, they would say negative confessions, but if we say Declarations of Innocence, because that's what you're, that's what you're declaring, you're declaring your innocence. You're moving towards being pure, innocent. Because even after these declarations, which uh, was not here, uh, you would say, I am pure four times after you've gone through things, these things and declared them. So the 42 declarations of innocence. And the first one right here on the bottom left, so you see the figures of the Neturu right here in the middle. You go to the far left. Right beneath that nature, that writing, that is the first one. We're going to go through that one. And this particular one is going to pretty much set the stage for the rest of them. Um, again, we're not going to go through all of these uh, this go around, but we're going to focus on the first one. Uh, this is the rest of that, uh, the 42. So we see the two Ma'at figures, Ma'ati. The double my double justices, if you will. So that's the rest of it. Sheet 32. So we focus here on this one. Not done I iniquity, or I have not done iniquity. So the iniquity is that word is fat. So when we look at the relief here, so this is where is fat begins, begins and ends. Is fat. That's your that's your your disorder, if you will. It is the opposite of ma'at. I've not done iniquity. So when you go to the rest of all the 42, it is really based off of this, this one. You know, I have not stolen. I have not defrauded the offerings. I have not been angry, you know, uh, just unjustifiably angry. Et cetera. All those things are based off of ISFET because those things create disorder in your society. So by maintaining order in your society, you want to maintain Ma'at. And the king in any African society is the primary one who goes to the deity of your community, of your country, of your district, etc. Your priest goes to the Neturu, goes to the Arisha, goes to the uh, uh, Abasan, goes to Loa, etc. on your behalf. So here you have what's called Henek Ma'at, presentation of Ma'at. The image comes from the temple of uh, Bet El Wali, Lake Nasser in Aswan, southern regions of modern day Egypt, Kemet. So this Usama Atras, the temple around that king, that great king, and that's what we should actually call him. Um, but otherwise, you would know him as uh, Ramasu or Ramasusway. I like to say Ramasusway uh, for reasons we can get into another time. Uh, and he presents Henek to Imana or Amun. So he presents the order that he maintains and keeps 
for his country because he's the one who's ultimately responsible. He's one in charge of your country. You know how you may hear someone say, I only deal with the person in charge. So he's responsible for the country. So if anything goes wrong in the country, it's on him. And he has to uh, be held accountable. So he presents to the deity, this is how I am accountable. He presents Henek Ma'at to Amun. Now, Emily Teeter, who's the author of a very important book called Presentation of Ma'at, Ritual and Legitimacy in Ancient Egypt, informs us this. The principles embodied in Ma'at, the goddess of truth, are a fundamental element in Egyptian civilization with emphasis upon tradition and unchanging values. She presided, she provided the sense of continuity that ensured the permanence of, and I continue on, of natural and social order. Okay. So what are these values that are common in comedic society, but not just comedic society? Throughout Africa, actually, because Ma'at is all throughout Africa, is not right. unique to Kemet. It is all over Africa. The word itself is all over Africa. The That's word right. Ma'at is all over Africa. This here is a selected list. This is not all the countries. This is all I could fit into one slide without it being too jumbled. Right. Even though it appears that way, but Ma'at is all over the place. There's more languages that has the word Ma'at in it. We all pronounce it uh, slightly differently, but it's, it's all there. Ancient Kemetic. Now, this comes from uh, the book, which I referenced uh, at the end of this. It will be uh, pertaining to African philosophy, um, in which uh, Theophile Benga is one of the contributing authors, and this comes from his chapter. So we have Ma'at, truth, Ma, truth, the Coptic, me, me, Mie, Mai. In Ethiopia, you have Moyo, Moyo, that's going to be very important down the line, Moyo, motive, reason. So truth and reason are inseparable. That's right. Okay. Truth and reason are inseparable. That's the Kafino speakers. In the Congo, we all know what a Congo is. You have it again, moyo, life, soul, mind. And in fact, instead of saying African spirituality or African or traditional African religion, we recognize from that great ancestor, um, uh, oh, almost drew a blank there. All right, so from the ancestor, uh, Dr. Fukiao, Kekia Bunseki Fukiao, this is one of his works. Uh, brings us Kimoyo. So Kimoyo is about vitalism, vitality. So African tradition is about Kimoyo. Mm. It's Kimoyo, vitality, not animism. Animism, religion, even spirituality is not adequate enough to really describe what our traditions, how our traditions operate. We have to use Af the, the concepts using Afrocentricity where we take African terms, African words to describe African realities. Kimoyo is is is, is more fitting term. Kimoyo and, and essentially Kimoyo is cognate with the word Ma'at. Sanjeti, can mm -hmm. you spell that? And and send Jason. Can you put it in the chat? Can you spell it for so, us, Jenny? Kimoyo, K I, and put a dot or period there, and then Moyo, M O Y O, Kimoyo. So we have comedic Kimoyo. We have Vodun, which is Kimoyo. We have uh, the Akon tradition, Kimoyo. We have Sheshe Lake Ba of the Yoruba people, Kimoyo. Sangoma, Kimoyo. Central African Republic, we have MOP, magic medicine, in order to know the truth. So in order for you to recognize, understand how medicine works, you have to understand order, 
what is the order of these plants that goes along with this element? You have to understand order. The Fong language, the Fong from the Fong people, my you know, uh, one of my ancestral groups, Mie, which means pure. Mie, pure. So when we say tabamie, to be physically, morally pure, that goes right along with what's happening in the Pertham Heru. Because even in Pertham Heru, the ancestor would say, I have a pure mouth with pure hands. I, you know, in fact, I think it's a, a chapter in the 80s, 84, Barbara Heru, uh, one of our earlier conversations a long time ago, when you took the time to tutor me in the Pertum Heru, we went through, I believe it was chapter 84, where it talked about being physically pure, where it says, you know, I have not eaten defecation, etc. So, Mia, to know, to know the truth. The self, having self-knowledge. Yoruba, Mo, to know, which is the truth, knowledge. Hasa, Ma, in, which is in, something in fact, indeed. Affirmative truth. Mat, in Northern Cameroon. Uh, they say a genie, but so, but it's an entity that that no has special knowledge. Nuer, Mat, total sum up forces. See, so Binga he tells us Mat is indeed the total of all virtues, all forces as ideals to guide man or people to their personal spiritual life. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share for a second. So I just have to ask you a quick question, Sanjeti. Um, as always, I'm sure that there are people who have learned something new. I know I have, which was, you know, which is why we have our Tuesday talk. A quick question that's a little, a little bit off topic. The shape and size of Africa that you had on the slide. Can you touch on that for a moment? Absolutely. So it just so happens that I was able to take the original so-called size and make it closer to what it actually would look like. So it just happened to fit. Um, Africa is not as, it's more elongated, taller, if you will, from top to bottom more than what's depicted on the, uh, I think it's called the Mercator map. It's actually smaller in the typical map than what it actually is. So it's actually larger. So the entire United States actually can fit inside of the Sahara Desert. Okay? And if we use the Southern orientation, that means South, the South, South African tip will be up, will be top. You will we'll use comedic orientation where south is up north is down east is to the left and west is to the right so hopefully that answers the question it that does. was a big y'all took it good i i went sit and got my grab my book mm -hmm. and i'm trying to get it out of the spotlight but if you can see it okay this looks a lot longer than what we're used to seeing it's bigger it's longer. Here we go. You can see it better now. Is this right, Sanjeti, from what you mm -hmm. see? Yep, yep. Okay, and so now with the other orientation, Sanjeti, can you speak on this, how I have it held okay. up? Okay, so that orientation is based on the comedic orientation of uh, cardinal points. So the word for South is Rashi or Rashiwe. And it's a word meaning like going up or south, if you will. But the way we know one is up and one is down is because the word for left side is the same word for east. Mm -hmm. See? Yabitet. Yabitet means the east. Yabite means left. See, the only way you can get that is if south is up mm -hmm. on the map, if you will. The word for West it, or the West is amentet, amentet, which means the West, 
amente, which means right side, right hand. The only way you get that is if south is up. And the word for downstream is mahi or mahiwe. It means downstream or north, if you will. This is why knowing the language is so important. Mm -hmm. I knew the word for, for uh, east and west, did not know that it overlaid with the word for left and right. And just also, this is African Holistic Health by Dr. Leva Africa, the great ancestor. And this, mm -hmm. this picture is, this is what it looks like, people. This is what our homeland looks like. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I thought now, it was important to mention now, that. Go ahead. Now, for me, so we're looking at the map flat. Now, if you look at the landscape from a transverse perspective, meaning sideways, and you're looking at land elevation, see, when you go to the two origins of the Hopi River or the Nile River, if you will, you have Lake Tana in Ethiopia, and you have uh, the mountains of the moon that you have in Uganda, Tanz Tanzania, et cetera. Well, the land elevation from that area, that region of Africa is up here. By the time you get to Kemet, it's down here. So this is up. When you get to Kemet, this is down. The water is going downstream. So Mahi is down. This is sea level. The origins of the of the two origins of the Hopi River are up here. And it goes down that way. So it's down. So north is down, because that's the direction of the water. Because hmm. the mountains is way up here. That Lake Tana is up here. And, and, and it, they meet eventually, like in a, in southern Sudan, and go down to sea level, which is the Wedgie Word or the Great Green Sea that we call the Mediterranean. Hmm. See what you learn when they can when someone can read the language. Wow, thank you. Okay, we're gonna return back to what you prepared, but I had to take that little break to acknowledge the shape, the shape and size of of our great motherland. All right. So, Baba, whenever you're ready, um, I can pull up the the covenants for you. Uh, check oh, your mic. Sorry, I I put you. Hold on. I'm sorry, I muted you when your phone call came in. Let me unmute you, Baba. Okay, go ahead, Baba. You should be able to be heard. If I may, you know, when um, when Sanjani and I get together, he knows that I'm very rebellious um, mm -hmm. because they, they 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 call me a mystic. Um, I I tend to I don't use the I guess I don't use the word priest too much. I'm more like an elder in the village. But you know, I, this whole question of this whole question of the the what you have shared in terms of the um, the directions uh, relating to to the um, to the position of the map is very interesting, no doubt about it. One of the things that um, I have a globe in here, and since there are many people here who are saying, of course, that the Earth is flat, <laughs> and uh, we know that the it seems as if the Earth is a globe, right? It seems to be round. And um, and when I when I if I was to stand on the um, at the equatorial zone and at the summer solstice and face the rising sun, um, my and I were to straddle if if I were to straddle the Great Lakes, where as you know the the equatorial line passes at the northern section of the Lake Nyanza Victoria. Now, when I, when I, um, if I were to straddle that equatorial line of the summer sol solstice, and I'm facing east, where the Horn of Africa or Somalia would be, then um, left would be to my north. Uh, north would be to um, to, uh, to 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 my left, um, and um, and um, my if I would have as I face east, the the right the right um, my right hand would be at the south. So I I have I have um, 
agonized over this this situation because as a, as a, as an Afrikan, I tend to my orientation is towards the the where the sun appears in the morning. We we like to call it sunrise, but it's not actually sunrise. It's more like earth turn, and um, so. I thought that um, when we place the map in the other direction with what is commonly known as the South at, at the top, it was sort of a like, I, I thought it was being somewhat reactionary because our orientation um, would not to me be um, North or South, neither pole would occupy our consciousness I thought that the solar region would occupy and the, the, the paths of Ra, the paths of the Aten Ra would occupy our consciousness. Uh, and so when Sanjedi just shared the, um, the directions and show that the directions relate also to the position uh, of, of the map, it, uh, it, it, cre uh, it created a sort of a, I, I'm still wondering <laughs> because I'm not about to, uh, to surrender my opinion that um, our focus ought to be um, east and west, not north or south. And um, because uh, we are people of Ra, and I think that our con um, a mentor would be um, behind our backs if we face east, you know? And, and so that would be what we call the, um, the, um, Abta or Amenta would be uh, the west, and Abta would be uh, the east as we face the, um, the the turning of the earth towards the sun in the morning. So that's just my little um, input that sometimes Sanjay and I we go back and forth. <laughs> but I'm I'm really humbled in uh, and appreciative of his grasp of the various. Um, the various aspects of African language uh, when he shows the, the continuity of the idea of Mayat in all of these different places. And he linguistically, uh, he employs what, what I would call linguistic sovereignty by using right. African terms and comparing African languages to each other. I think that's brilliant, my beloved brother. Yes, and um, so yeah. I, I'm grateful for that, for that tutorial, because mm. I, I'm happy to learn from some of my students and from younger people. I'm always in school, so I want to thank you for that, my beloved. Yes, and I'm yeah. sure that the rest of the people who are listening feel the same way. Um, if I may, um, yes, please. So, what, what, you know. I'm glad we're having this exchange here between the, the craftsman and the scribe. <laughs> All right, the craftsman and the scribe. Because, you know, we don't always agree on everything. That's you know, true. So a lot of people, you, know, you know, people know we don't agree on everything. Uh, but yet we have mutual respect. That's right. So, you know, he'll give me an idea. I'm going to say, uh, I don't know about that. I won't say it that way. But I'll say <laughs> something like, well, if I may, may I offer you this other perspective, because sure. you still have to respect your elders, whether or not you agree with them or not. It's, it's having tact. It's about having uh, uh, language dexterity and adaptability to get your message across while you don't have to be offensive. Yeah? And it's not about, well, let me tell the truth. I don't care who, you know, who don't like it. Da, 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 da. We, get, we get people like that where, yeah. where they'll use truth as a weapon to hurt see True. see see people get this thing well well telling the untruth or lying is hurtful yes okay but people will also use truth and facts to attack you because it makes them feel better about themselves mm -hmm. and they feel better like, oh i didn't even got a lie i can just tell the truth i just want to reveal all this stuff about you and, and how you're wrong Right. And I can get away with it because it's the truth. Hey. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, but the intention behind behind certain things is, is nefarious. So, you know, I'll never 
and again, it also goes back to how much you respect the person too. So I respect Bob. I respect Bob Haru Haru Akwasamasapata because you know I, we go back to I'm in my early twenties, you know, and he's had a profound influence on on my journey. Okay. Now, even though you know I've come up, I've come across different things, come to different conclusions. It doesn't mean all of a sudden I'll have to disrespect this man. No, not at all. So again, we have di differences, disagreements, etc. But but I'm always honored. You know, Bob Haru will call me and and ask me a question about a phrase, um, where's the document, this word, what is this, etc. And then I'll, you know, reciprocate the respect and I give him my perspective. I'll tell him what the research is, etc. And you know, and allow him to make his own decision on how he wants to handle that you know i don't dictate to him like you need to do this no i give him what he asked me for and then he can use it how he sees fit and that's how we you know we treat our elders you know that's so, so true um it, it's always um we have a lot of fun too and yeah. um and it's always been very very respectful um <clears throat> but i'm a craftsman not a scribe, even though I am proficient in the symbology with which, that I use to create the, um, the joyery, the art that I create. Um, when I'm looking for a grammatical um, certainty, I will always give uh, Sanjeti a call and say, what is, how, do you, how would you say this? And he always obliges me and gives me some guidance in that regard, you know? So I want to thank you for that, my brother. And it continues, and we will always be doing that. Because as you know, I have never, when it comes to the research, um, because we have a lot of talk of scholarship, um, and I feel that the, the time has come for us to marry both the right and left hemispheres, that intuition is not something that we ought to discard because it comes from the right hemisphere of the brain, the feminine side. Uh, as an artist, we find ourselves tapping into both hemispheres simultaneously because it's on the right side, the ideas are, are um, contemplated, and it's on the left that they're executed. So that's, that's something that I continue to, um, to use. But when I'm looking for grammatical certainty, I will always go to a scribe, and, and uh, Sanjeti is a very proficient one. So that I want to also say that and thank you. And thank you for, for like for your craftsmanship. And I can tell everyone here that Baba Haru Akwasama Sa Pata, he is truly the son of Pata. Like he is, he is Pata. Um, and what he does as an inspiration on how he crafts the the the, the art pieces, there is more than art. There, there, there is, it's, it's history, it's geometry encapsulated in physical imagery, physical objects. Yeah. He's the hand of Pata. And, and what I learned from, from Baba Haru is he it's finds crazy. enlightenment <laughs> in his craft. That's why it's so good, because his heart is into it. He's he's fully committed in every detail, every piece. He does it 100 percent. And the way that that has influenced and inspired me is that when I'm writing Meru Nature and I'm, I'm into the geometry of the signs, the placement of the of the ideograms, et cetera, I'm finding enlightenment in that. So that the so it's also a craft, if you will in the scribalhood. And this is one of the ways that the skill that Heru Akra Samad Sapata has enlightened me. Because I've, wa I've watched him, you know, go into the craft. Now, to the onlooker, oh, that looks easy. No. <laughs> it's the years of skill that makes it look easy. It takes years to be able to do it quickly. So when you pay us for a service, you're not paying us because, because oh, it looks easy. You're paying us for the time that is taken in order to do it that fast, if you will, or to do it that efficiently. So, you know, I've learned that 
skill from uh, Herak Rasamaj and I apply it to the scribal art in the same way. Uh, hold one second. I got to put in. Okay, okay, Bobby, you're unmuted. I just, I was trying to inconspic inconspicuously show Pata and it just didn't work out. Cause, you know. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> but this is Pata. This is the bottom of Pata. Sorry, my head's in the way. It's kind of distracting. Let me, I want to give a background. There we go. Can you see that? This way. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. This. You there we are. Uh -huh. There we are. I'm, Pop, yeah. The grand architect of the universe. That's it. Right grand, here. Grand there architect of the universe. That's a beautiful one. That's a beautiful um, image of Patar. As a matter of fact, yes. Right, and uh, I think in Tony, Brown, in Tony Browder's book, he shows and he, he speaks about how the Oscar that they use on Hollywood was copied from Right. This, you can you see know. him holding it up. He's yes. holding it. This is, these mm -hmm. are his brown hands. That's right. Because his skin is brown because he That's was an right. African. And this is where you see the, uh, the Oscar was taken from. Look at this. All the way down to the feet being together right. and wrapped. Okay. That's right. And here it is right here, guys. I finally got this right to hold it up. Mm -hmm. And his brown hands are holding it. And here's his brown face. But Ty's darker than me, y'all. Y'all know I'm black. Okay. And he's darker than me. All right. <laughs> and Pata, and I maybe you've heard me say this before. Pata is one of my favorite. Pata is my favorite because Pata, let me, Pata looks like a black dude from Philly, all the way down to the beard, <laughs> y'all. That's right. All the way down to the beard. Put on like a chocolate brown black man from Philly. Yeah, what? yeah, okay. yeah. Sanjetti's <laughs> feeling himself right now. I wasn't yeah, mean to explain right. that. I'm just saying. Selfless. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah. All right, back, back to the program. Pata, uh, pata, the word, listen, pata means, you know, like it means to sculpt, to create. It literally means the creator. Mm, to. So to carve, to make open work. Um, so, Baba, um, well, whenever you're ready, let me okay. know when you're ready and I can pull up the imagery. All right. So I was asked to um, to speak on some of these, the 42 new covenants of my art. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, as I explained in the beginning, we decided to create these in order to address some of the bad habits that we've um, acquired and, um, and to keep us mindful of our need to be, to be um, loyal to our ancestral roots, to our African ancestral roots. As a matter of fact, in the in the covenants, I spell the the word for what is commonly called Africa by Afraka. I use three syllables from the Metuneter. Uh, Af or Efu uh, means flesh. Um, ra refers not just to the sun that we see every day, but to the hidden sun, the sun behind the sun. As a matter of fact, in the Pertum, in the um, in the Seshu uh, Merkut, the uh, pyramid text, um, we constantly see a reference to Ra as the hidden sun, um, and of course, then the, as which is um, contrary to the um, to Aten Ra which would be the revealed son. Um, and of course, you know, the, um, the prophet um, Atnere Akun, or who they call Akneten, and his wife, um, Atenre Nefer, Neferu, Neferiti, uh, they were the, the prophet and prophetess, if you will, of the Atenra um, evolution. And so um, I spell it Afraka because I think the time has come for us to establish uh, what I call linguistic sovereignty. And what um, Sanjeti presented tonight, drawing from many African sources to show how Mayat still lives on in these different cultures, is exactly um, the implementation and the actual use of linguistic sovereignty, all based upon 
Afrakan culture. Also, the um, I use that that spelling because it is um, it is both uh, uh, it indicates a cosmic a cosmic um, origin as well as an earthly origin. Um, the, the spelling Africa. Um, I spoke to a a, a deaf Muslim brother of mine, and he felt that the spelling um, recalls the uh, Farak, um, which is um, the Islamic word or the um, Arabic word for separation. And of course, we do not want it to be separated. And so I use that term, the, the spelling Afraka. So for those of you who read the 42 covenants that you would find on the, it's the one item that we have in the on the page of the Shrine of Ptah when you Google it. Um, so you'll understand why I use that spelling. At any rate, um, to give commentary on, well, let's begin with number one. Not do I flirt with ancestral treason by failing to identify myself as African in the Americas and the diaspora. Um, so, because right now we have we have many um, arguments and apparently some disagreements as to how should we call what should we call ourselves. Um, some of us have embraced that insulting N word as a word in which we call ourselves. We call it a term of endearment. <laughs> I I beg to I wonder if those sisters and brothers who are hanging from poplar trees down south, when they heard that last word that they heard before their neck was snapped, if that is a, could be ever um, changed into a term of endearment. But um, African people are very inventive and uh, we can perform miracles, but I still have problems, I guess it's because of my age, using that word to apply to us. Um, so I use the term Afrakan, and um, and as I said before, it, it, it connotes both uh, an earthly as well as a cosmic origin. And um, so we should never be afraid to use that term and to describe ourselves and to identify ourselves as such. Um, as I move down to number seven, as I said, we want to do about seven or nine of these just to go into more um, detail into not do I protect by my silence the enemies of my art who threaten the peace and safety of my community. Now, by my silence, so you see, are you saying, Baba Heru, that we should be, um, we should be tattletales, that we should rat on each other? Well, you see, this is where the, a council of elders should arise among those of us who is claiming this ancient culture. Because certainly um, you, you would not want to go, and um, I understand why they would, one would be apprehensive in calling the um, law enforcement when sometimes you may be um, playing Russian roulette because some may have a certain political frame of mind that may be right or left, uh, two sides of one coin, and sometimes it may be dangerous to go and make a complaint um, to a source that you think was going to be helpful, and many times you're going to make the complaint and you're the one who get beat up. <laughs> you have been the victim of a crime and you find yourself getting whipped <laughs> Be, uh, by the one that you call to complain about the crime that has been committed against you. So that's the reason why these covenants should be better served if there is a council of elders. And by this time, in this um, resurrection, this Happy Valley resurrection, there should be a, a formulated a not only a, um, a council of elders, a Maatian elders, uh, that should be something that uh, should be the first order of business. And we may not have 42 assessors, we may not have that numerous amount of elders to sit on a, um, on a board of, of my art, but I think it's something that we must put into place 
so that these covenants can be dealt with in-house. We would not have to rely on calling anyone to deal with our internal issues when one or two or three or however many of us um, goes against these covenants or the 42 uh, confessions of my art. So um, there again, I come back to that uh, number seven, not do I protect by my silence the enemies of my art who threaten the peace and safety of my community. Now, I would not uh, be against anyone um, adding to this or making a comment on these as I go uh, over each one. Uh, I would uh, prefer to have a conversation and an input from those of you who are listening, um, not, that, not uh, to deny just that uh, your presence, but to have an input in um, making this more clear to those who may claim this. And these 42 covenants should become staple, the, the, the ones that we have modern and the ancient ones should become staples in rites of passage, which is something that we all should be um, signing on to, rites of passage again and making it part of the reclamation of our culture. Let me now go. So, does anyone have any comments to make about that? Not right, protect by my silence, the enemies of my art who threaten the peace and safety of my community. Hello. So, family, I just want to say this is an opportunity for for you to have direct interaction with Baba. I know sometimes when we're around him, we just sit and listen, and in person, people just sit and listen even more. And he's like, "What are y'all going to talk? Like, we're here to all." Oh. I'll talk. So it's kind of the same thing right here, right now. So, you know, uh, just not do I protect by my silence, the enemies of my art who threaten the peace and safety of my community. How do we feel about that? Who are the people who threaten the safety of our community? We know that it's the police. We also know that it's some of our own. And, uh, you know, so let's have a, some, some, some dialogue with Baba and uh, people in the chat, just put your, your comment in the chat and either I or Sanjeti will read the comment and then we can get a nice dialogue going going on. So um, I know sometimes it takes a little bit for some things to kind of settle in, but I know y'all have some questions y'all wanna ask Baba, so you can go right on ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, should I continue? Yes, yes, please continue, Baba. And then, you know, okay. people put, put some questions in the chat, okay? All right. Now, do I indulge in ageism or tolerate racism? Now, um, that, is, that is very, that's highly significant to me. Um, when I'm walking the streets and I pass a, a brother or sister on the street, and, you know, there's a saying that all skin folk ain't kin folk. And it becomes clear to me that that is so true um, because many times I would, I would never pass someone without giving them a nod or how you doing or something like that. And I'm interested really in, in not just a, a passing gesture or how you doing, oh, I'm okay, you know. But um, sometimes I don't mind a, 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 a half a minute conversation with someone I'm just, seeing for the first time but it's passing on the street because a lot of us are going through a lot in these times especially and many of us are walking in a state of anger in a state of disappointment and hurt and um and you can it, it, it we carry it sometimes in our posture in the way we walk we carry it in our on our face on those frowns that we may have and so uh I, yes i'm sorry Papa. I just have to interject. I hear um, some static. Um, I'm not sure, Sanjay, did you hear it? Is it oh, my paper? Okay. It might just be me. If anyone hears okay. some static in the chat, let me know. But if not, I hope it's just me by myself and no one else hears it. I'm, I'm sorry, Baba. You can- not go. Go ahead, Baba, you can continue. I okay. So, so it says oh, um, uh, I'm sorry, we have um, 
Sanet Shankar. So first we had Shahid Douglas, who said that you know one uh, source of of threatening our community could be the government. Uh, Sanet Shankar says could be family even. We deal with pedophilia, drug and alcoholism. We used to sleep uh -oh. under the rug. Oh no, number, we, number seven. That's covered. That's covered in these forty-two. Oh, that's coming up. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna read the rest of this because I I can't I can't really hear you that clearly. I think it's me on my end. And when you get to it, if if you could uh, please address it, then I'm sorry, I can't really hear it clearly. So the rest of what she said was we break. Uh, we break the what goes on in this house stays in this house stigma. So I'll, I'll tag mm. in and then I'll, I'll go, go to mute and hopefully stop hearing static on my end. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Baba, you have the floor. That's, that's so true, okay. Number 14 here. Um, not do I hold on to beliefs which contradict my hereditary ancestral knowledge, history, and culture. Now, th this is very significant, uh, holding on to beliefs, because this is the age of I know. We have passed the age of Aquarius, I mean, of, 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 of Pisces, which was the I believe age. And as I said before earlier, that we have this scripture that everyone likes to, to repeat, saying that my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. It didn't say destroyed for the lack of belief, even though in many cases our beliefs become our addictions. And uh, as you know, addictions are not easily conquered because people will fight and commit murder to hold on to their addictions. You, you speak to an alcoholic about the danger of alcohol and the minute he gets out of your sight, he's going to go and get one from the liquor store or someone on crack. You know, you may tell them the danger of that and they will likewise. But there are other kinds of addictions that we have. We have psychological addictions. We have, um, I would say, some sometimes religious addictions you know, um, because of words that have not been properly translated. And also we have addictions to some, um, to some distortion of, of truth and, and in terms of the placement of certain scriptures, where did they come from? You know, so that's something that we ought to um, also address. So what is our one example of a heredity ancestral knowledge is, for instance, uh, the concept of resurrection. Even baptism um, was very prominent in our ancient legacy. If you visited the temple of Ipitaisut, the temple of what they call Amun-Ra at the city of, of uh, now called Karnak, you will see that there's a pool in front of the temple where you can be sure that the ancestors would uh, dip before entering and even wash perhaps wash their feet before entering into the precinct of the temple and so that was um, that I think it was um, um, Gerald Massey who said that the ancient Chemites were particular Baptists so now we have the Baptist faith the Baptist church but um, the baptism goes way back and even um, as you can see on some of the papyri Baptism by the sprinkling of water over the head of an individual. And many times it's, it's pictured as onks coming out of the, of the vase used for or the vase that's used for baptismal purposes. Okay. So, not um, do I hold on to beliefs which contradict my hereditary ancestral knowledge, history, or culture. Right. And talking about our history. History. What are we speaking of Egyptian history? Someone used the term Egypt today and um, they were in here and I said, well, um, we're not Egyptian because if you if you claim to be Egyptian, then you are not giving honor to the to the name, the ancestral name of the place. Um, and 
I, I insist that we resurrect the true name of the nation, the Nile Valley Nation, the Happy Valley Nation, it was Smai Kawi, unity of the two regions. And again, I like to emphasize that this union of two regions is not just about the geographical location, but it also has to do with the, um, with the, the right and left brain hemispheres, something which a lot of us do not um, give enough exercise to the right brain because, of course, we have been forced in the Western culture to be left-handed, left-handed just to stimulate the, I mean, a right-handed just to stimulate the left hemisphere, the intellect. We, we deal a lot with um, the intellectual side of our, of our existence but a lot of us are afraid to delve into the, um, the intuition. Our women, of course, uh, have the intuition going 24-7. That's the reason why you get into a discussion, an argument with a sister, and she comes to you from both hemispheres simultaneously, you're out for the count. And that's why some brothers will rely upon their, their hands to shut her up rather than uh, employ words to... <laughs> to meet her argument. And that's so unfortunate. And that's another thing. You never put your hand on a woman unless it is to soothe her or to bring her something of beauty. Um, she is not your child. You cannot correct her by becoming her instant dentist and knocking her teeth out because you didn't like what she said. Learn words, my brothers, so that you can defend yourself verbally and with the proper tone. And all of us can need to remember that the use of words goes with the tone by which we express those words. We go to uh, number 16. Yes, beloved, go ahead. If, I'm, if I may. Um, yeah, by all means. So the one about, you know, not practicing religions that contradict our ancestral traditions, the ones you, you just read, mm -hmm. you know, we should be aware of traditions that, that would tell us to not honor our own ancestors, that, mm -hmm. to, that that encourage you to turn your head at their own at their burial and funeral, and that you pour a libation to honor them is somehow uh, some type of sin of witchcraft, etc. While at the same time, they encourage you to do that for theirs. Mm -hmm. True. See, you know, let's take let's take uh, three images. You have one person who is, let's say, cutting a bovine, a bull or a cow from ear to ear, drain the blood, um, put the, you, you may even cut the animal, put it on a pyre and light the fire and say a prayer. So mm -hmm. this person does it, uh, they, that person will call it, say, kosher, kosher meat, okay? Then another person, you know, would do it, exact the exact same procedure, cut the bovine ear to ear, drain the blood, cut, cut the bovine up, put it on top of a pyre, let the fire cook it, pray to the most high by their own language and say, now it's pure and it call it halal me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's say we go to, we do, do the exact same procedure with a bovine or a bird or whatever case may be, you know, drain the blood out, cut it up, put on a pyre, light the fire, the smoke go up, you offer it to the deity and then you eat it and be caught and then they'll they'll say oh that's animal sacrifice right? <laughs> yeah. because all right so we do that in sheshe like ba we do it in other african traditions okay we do it in vodun <laughs> all right but when we do it with our culture orientation it's something wrong with it but when they do it somehow it's a blessing mm. and i'm talking about the exact same procedure dude so it is redirecting your attention from your own ancestors to their ancestors to empower them because of one of the most empowering things that you can do is ancestor veneration. And I've said this on many, many occasions, everyone on the planet worships one of or a combination of the following, the sun, the moon, star seasons, sex organs and ancestors and animals. They're in elements. There's no exception to the rule. That includes atheists. Okay. Mm. 
there's no whether it's atheists, devil worshippers, Satanists, um, uh, agnostics, whatever title you want. Everybody on the planet worships. And I'm gonna say it one more time: one of or a combination of the following: the sun, the moon, the stars, elements, sex organs, ancestors, animals. There's no exceptions, none. Okay. Mm. All the deities to say monotheism, etc. Yahweh or Yahweh, and excuse me if I'm mispronouncing it, okay, is connected to well, Shaddai, which is a moon deity, okay, or a mountain deity, Shaddai, okay. All these the, the different names in the biblical narrative, those different Canaanite gods. El is a Canaanite deity. I've seen a statue of El in the Oriental Institute of Chicago, so I've seen an image of El the God of the Bible in Orange Institute of Chicago is in. Okay. So we can, we can dead that conversation. Allah was the moon God and law had a wife a lot. Okay. It misses it in the Quran and we know from history. So Allah was the moon God case closed next. Okay. <laughs> we know the image the, the, the European image of Jesus Christ. We all know that that comes from, you know, Zeus, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Zeus was deity of storms and throwing lightning bolts. There's no exception to the rule whatsoever. Now, we respect people's religion, okay? Respect what you believe, respect us. You know, we're just up front with it. <laughs> you know, we just don't have to hide it. Okay, mm -hmm. if it's moon deity, it's moon deity. Okay. No, no, we don't worship the sun. We worship the power behind the sun. And I'm talking about some of us who are in African traditions or into Kemet who feel ashamed. Yes, we worship the sun. It's okay. I honor the sun. In fact, the sun, without the, the, the sun creates a protective barrier. And again, this is according to astrophysics. This is not religious. It's not my opinion. Has a protective barrier or field around our solar system that protects us from cosmic radiation outside of the solar system, literally. Mm -hmm. okay. Again, not my opinion. I didn't get it from an esoteric book. That comes straight from astrophysics okay? mm -hmm. and astronomy, not astrology, but astronomy. So I honor the sun because the sun is literally like a father protecting us from cosmic well, radiation. Yeah. Now, I didn't mean to go too far off. I no, 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 by all means. I, 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 I appreciate your input because um, we, we, we have this... Um, this defamation against the ways of African veneration. Um, and yet the same, the same people who will accuse Africans of, um, of this type of um, hedonism, um, they, they would, uh, they worship on a, a, on a Sunday. And then others would react by worshiping on a Saturday or on a Friday. The fact is that, um, Early, early human beings always equated those days with deific principles or forces, you know? Like, for instance, you have the, the Friday was named after Frida, okay? Yeah. Who is a Nordic deity. We have, we have Thursday named after Thor. Thor. Okay? Now, let's say when I, form, when I reformulated the, um, the, the colors of the day and, um, and we, we, uh, we apply the colors with a, with a particular netaru, uh, with one of the netaru, um, then we, we, we find within the day, even though the, the names of the days here in the West are not um, original African terminologies, the fact is if you trace the, the names back to the deific principle that was copied and the name changed, you, it lead you right back to to the uh, to the metronetra because if you deal with uh, let's say Thor, who is Thor? They will tell you that well Thor is a Nordic deity who is Lord of the Hammer. What is the hammer? A hammer is a tool. Who uses in Kemet? Who would use the hammer? A craftsperson would use a hammer. Who is the craftsperson related to? In Pata. Kemet, he would be under Pata. You know the thing. The same thing would apply if he was a a Sunu. Uh, a, what they would call a physician, okay? Who would be using uh, uh, um, forceps? Who would be using um, scapels? You know, 
So on and on, we can trace the principle back to the particular deific force that is being that is being honored or venerated. And another, another thing is that these terms, you know, we find ourselves arguing over English words. What's the difference between veneration and worship? You know, you, we are accused of worshiping many gods. Well, that's impossible for us as African because we do not, uh, that term, that German word or that Gothic word was not something that we, you, you find throughout the continent as a name of deity, okay? Even though um, uh, Brother Imhotep, um, he, he goes back to show, he said, well, uh, God is, has, an Afri is a, has African origin. I, would, um, I, I read some of what he said about that. You, you know the brother, he's in the, um, in the uh, squad with you. Yeah, once you don't at that point, I'll, I'll clarify. But Yeah, yeah I, I need to, uh, you can start right now. Okay, all right. It, how so, you trace the G-O-D word as a, as a continent-wide term by which we venerate deity. Okay, so we know that there are different language families, right? Yes. So if we, African people, would you agree that we are the ones who first came up with language, who first articulated speech? Yes. Would you agree? So we all agree that speech comes from us, correct? Okay. Yes? Do I put that in the chat? Would you all agree? Would you, you we would agree. And this is something we definitely, we, we rightfully boast on this. So which also means if we use that same logic, that means that Europeans got language from us, right? So now let's go into the details. Linguistically, uh, you have what they call Indo-European as a language family. So under Indo-European, you have Germanic, you have Italic, that's where Latin comes from. Uh, uh, you have Greek and you have the other branches. According to the researchers by G.J.K. Campbell Dunn, an Austrian linguist, and, and even others in the 1930s, going back to the 1930s, they say that Indo-European as a language family comes out of Africa, mm -hmm. but it takes shape in Europe, okay? Because remember, the logic is if we taught them language, if it comes from us, then we have to, we can't break the logic. That means that Indo-European comes from us as well. If we say that we are the first people to, the ancestor Runuko Rashidi and many others would say, we're the first people to populate the whole planet, right? Then we can't break the logic. That means that we are the first Europeans, okay? So we can't, I'm thinking, I'm not saying you're doing it, Baba. I'm yeah, saying no, no, that, no, I understand. I'm saying that we, we can't do that and then suddenly switch the logic because it feels convenient. Right. We created, we are the ones who created Indo-European. If we mm -hmm. created language, if we are the ones who first articulated these things, and we're the first people around the planet, that means that we're the first ones to create Indo-European. Okay. So, but right, now, right. But let, let me go to the God word. Let me go to the God word. Now, again, Germanic, in which it comes out of, okay, we're not saying that the G-O-D, that someone went into Africa directly, heard the word, and then brought it up. We're not saying that. We're talking about this is a development over tens of thousands of years. This is nothing that's immediate. See? See, yeah, so my, we migrated into what we're calling Europe, okay, the Grimaldis. I think we call it the Grimaldis, okay? And then over time, Ice Age, all these things occurring over a period of 40,000 years, after that, then you have what's characteristically called Indo-European. When they come out of the ice, we transform in those Africans who got stuck there, again, mixing in with Cro-Magnon Man um, and, and other pre-modern pre humans, then create what you now have, your, what were characteristically European people. So we're not saying that I can step on the African continent now and I hear them using G-O-D as an indigenous African word. Not That's not what we mean. We're saying that we can trace it back to Africa, 
but this is over a period of thousands and thousands of years. This is not something that just happened, say, a hundred years ago. So that that's the clarity behind that. Okay. Hopefully that clear, clears up a little bit. But now, uh, still, let, me, still, let, and if I may, let me inject this here. Mm -hmm. The problem I have with it, it only posits a totally male concept because the pronoun that in modern usage, when we go to church, we pray to him. We come from a matrilineal and matrifocal culture to just always invoke the name of a deity that's totally male is a problem if you call yourself of African ascent. That's a fact. You, that is a problem. And you see, there's no getting away from the fact that two billion people on earth who come from the Christian faith, my father was one, like, likewise, use, use that the he pronoun, the his pronoun, and never the she. Okay, and to go further, the very people who popularize that um, Germanic or Gothic word in modern times, um, they 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 never um, pray to her. And the and that that name that we pray to in the in the male vernacular never has a a wife. Never has it's it, it's 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 not in keeping with the tendency of African culture to be ma'atiko, going back to all of those terms that you use that shows the continue to continuity of my art, you know, mm -hmm. we we are we are still you see I find that we find we find it convenient in order not to change because of our, our addictions to hold on and find excuses for holding on to things when you look deeper in it, it does not comport with African culture to be constantly using that word or even the other word from the people of the desert who always who got rid of all the female manifestations of deity in the Kaaba and totally posits a totally male concept of deity and that's problematic and to me that verges on ancestral treason to make it so popular I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the origin of language but in terms of its present day use, it keeps us trapped in contradiction to African culture, which is matrilineal and matrifocal. And yeah. again, yeah. when you look at the how it's expressed in the in the Medunedra, the, the earth man and woman who came down from the the um the, the, the womb of Newt, their names are spelt with two thrones, the throne of the king, as, er, the R is the I, the maker, the creator of the throne. Why is the king the throne maker? Because when he sits as a child in his mother's lap, her lap is the throne. And therefore, she also carries that lap in her name, as, with the as throne, and the the loaf, which is a which is a provision for nourishment. Some say a breast, but some say more a loaf. The, the tea is the determinative for the feminine, the presence of the feminine principle in the metuneta, as you know, because all of the deities, all the female deities, have a T at the end of their name to indicate the presence of the feminine principle, and um, we don't see that. In um, in um, in the um, in the use of this Germanic word, even though the D and the T are interchangeable in the, in linguistics, you know. Yeah. So that's now, just my, my, my little. Uh, it's all good, you know. Uh, you know, uh, we we agree more than than I think uh, uh, we we both well realize here. So mm -hmm. so now to add to, you know, in my explanation in in, in what you just offered is that. While the word thousand, say 10,000 years ago may have come out of Africa and went into Europe and then transformed to be all the other things, right? The spirit, the character, the cultural character yes. that gives us that word today is different than the long range origin. I'm gonna say long range origin. Okay. So the long range origin of 
that word G-O-D comes out of Africa, but the more, I would say the shorter range when it passed through uh, centuries comes directly out of Europe and then it carries that that cultural character which is different from Africa. Patriarchy, yes. So, That's what um, Now, while I, while studying Africa, I'm not totally against patriarchy because there is African patriarchy that has nothing to do with Europe. But it's different than, say, Eurasian patriarchy, like the Maasai in East Africa, they're, they're patriarchal. In fact, some of my ancestors who are uh, the Fula, Fulbe, many people say Fulani, are patriarchal. Okay, But it's not European. Okay? True. But then, but at the same time, do we hear about women being abused? So Sanjay, need- yep. can, can you explain what patriarchy patriarchy looks like when it's African in origin. So from what I'm understanding, the patriarchy that f- from 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 your um, your ancestry or the people you're talking about now was not influenced by Arab invasion, Muslim invasion, Christian invasion, or European invasion. Is that right? Uh, well, I specifically um, mentioned Europe. So, okay. all right, yeah. So, look, look, okay, what is patriarchy? Patriarchy and matriarchy. Arc, arc means, say, head. And it's really about six, lineage succession. So lineage succession is where uh, where the parent passes property rights um, of household, et cetera, to the child. So matriarchy is, um, I'm sorry, lineage. I'm sorry, matrilinear. Matrilinear is about lineage, passing down the uh, property and uh rights status rights to a child so matriarchal that's to the daughter uh matrilineal that's to the daughter patrilineal that's to the son father the son mother the daughter okay now archie is where one of the two has more of a political cultural dominance okay dominance is not always evil now, of course in our experience the people who dominate us we would consider them evil, but dominance is not, it's more about who has responsibility. Now, when we go to the African context, if we say patriarchal in an African context, that means the man is assuming responsibility for the safety and health of the family, which the safety and health of the community, safety and health of the country. That's what the archie is about patriarchy that's why when you look in ancient kemet according to charles finch um kemet was a patriarchal society but it was but it found a balance between patriarchy and matrilineal mm. okay that's why well, you were here she totally broke with that didn't she Huh? Oh yeah, yeah. She's like, mm, right? <laughs> so, so, no. Um, Shetta said he, enough of that. It's time for the ascension of the divine feminine. <laughs> yeah. So again, because see, when you're dealing in the world, and again, let, let, let's, let's let's be real here. If if I have an army, and again, I res- respect to the ladies, but let, let's be real here. If I have 20 men down there, again, no weapons or anything. And the 20 women over here, and they're going to clash together. Who's going to who's likely to win that fight? Again, when I talk about exceptions to the rule, or what if men are going to win? Okay, because on average, men are stronger than women by 30%. Okay, again, not my opinion, this is the reality. This sure. is why in battle, you put the men in the front. Because if somebody's going to die, let the men die, not the women. Too. I'm sure, ladies, you want to be protected, right? Yes, because we got the standing community saying men are not protecting us, etc. Why is that? Because women expect men to protect. Well, how are we going to do that? That's okay, right. men go in the front to fight in the front to protect in the front. True, women, you're not supposed to be there. Okay, <laughs> now there's exceptions to the rule. Right. Okay, the one offs, but that's not in the nature. The nature is for the man to go out and die so that. The ladies can so that you can live because you you got to make sure that women that children are taken care of etc and that we can live on i'll go and die you have to go on and live right okay so that's the nature 
So okay. now, as far as responsibility, patriarch is where the man takes responsibility for the welfare. So if something goes wrong, it's on him, not the lady, not the wife. Now, matriarchy is, is the opposite. That's where the women take responsibility for the welfare. So if something goes wrong, it's on you. See? So now, throughout so, Africa, so long then, story. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So then uh, if we are going to embrace Ma'at, then isn't it time we, uh, especially in this happy age, the, the happy means a twin, it means two. Isn't it time then now for us to introduce Ma'atiaki? I agree with that. I agree with that. Or mm -hmm. matriarchy, but Ma'atiaki. How about that? Yeah. Isn't it time in putting the things back in order, the putting things to be back. Right. Putting things back in order. Now, watch this. Dr. Ben, that great ancestor, says, for every God, there's a goddess, and for every goddess, there's a God. Right? Well, what's not as popular, you have Ma'at, which is the mother female deity you also have ma which is a male deity every single nature and the nature has a compliment a gendered compliment so ma and ma are actually <laughs> together well ma it wouldn't ma be expressed as the as the cubit that plinth that is the foundation where the throne of asa sits it has a wedge a slanted and it's a it's a it's a um, rectangular glyph. Yeah, that, the, that's right, the that, ma. that's a platform. So it's yeah. ma. Yes, ma. Well, that's no, so that's that's that's, that's 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 the that's the ma of measure. Where with the woman, it's the it's the ma it's the mayat of weight, right? That your heart is the her instrument is is the scales, and ma's instrument is the measure it would seem because that's that that uh, wedge on which the throne of a saw is found is founded upon because when you approach if, if you will look at the papyrus of anui you will see that's that 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 slant which is must be at the same slant of the slope of the pyramid and that's the ma or the the um the um the symbol of measurement whereas she deals with the right weight so you have the right measure and the right weight that is ma right. and my art yes yeah and, I agree. right and then going into the platform see rem remember everyone that every metanetra sign every hieroglyph from kemet is an object true that platform is a literal platform that the deity is upon stands upon stands erect upon True. And when you go up or the king, now remember a king in Africa could be a man or a woman. Okay. That's a fact, not my opinion. Okay. Mm -hmm. You still have women kings today. Okay. So, because it's a position, like you say, president of it's the United States. The title. The right. president is not, it could be a man or a woman. Right. The president, is the CEO of a company can be a man or a woman. When you say new suit, that that's a that is it that office anyway. So when the king or the priest approaches the deity, they walk up steps to a on a platform. So when you see that glyph, that's actually you walking up to the deity. In order to get to the deity, you have to rise up. You have to go up on an angle True. and walk up and be pure in order for you to approach the deity. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's that platform. That's the glyph that you're looking at. Too. All yeah. right, let's let's move let's on. Keep going. We, we're All right, let's almost there, up. right? They, oh, by the way, Sashat, this is what um, Sanjeri and I do all the time. <laughs> we, I can we're imagine. Just, we're just exposing it today. But when he comes in here to the studio, we do we go back and forth like that a lot. It, it's 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 how we sharpen our tools, and of That's course right. how I learn how I learn what he's learning and vice versa. Yes. Well, Sanjeti, the next time you go and you're coming into the city, you got to hit me up so I can meet you there and we can, I can learn from you. I'll bring some food. We can all eat afterwards. <laughs> That's good. Okay. All right. Not do I rape physically, mentally, or spiritually the body, mind, or spirit of any woman, man, or child. That's a very heavy one there, right? 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's self-explanatory. Not do I chemically alter my skin complexion or hair texture. That's another one. Um, where we show pride in how we are made. I don't, that's, um, then we have, and somebody was, well, what about wigs? Well, that was part of our culture. Um, and, um, and as you know, the um, modern man has used wigs as part of the expression, I guess, of Ma'at, uh, the divine feminine, in many of the courts in England, they wear powdered wigs. Um, and of course, the those countries that are colonized by French and the British, likewise, even on Africa today, they wear these wigs. But we see that that was part of the dress code of the ancient uh, people of the Nile, likewise. So, um, but of course, the, the wigs were made of the of, of, of some of the wigs were made from the hair of the in, in individual that was fashioned into these uh, into these um, wear for the head that were literally air conditioned because they didn't sit directly on the scalp. They they, they there was a certain amount of space between the the the, uh, the wig and the and the scalp that allowed it to be air conditioned to breathe. Okay, um, the, uh, we have the last uh, th three here quickly. Not do I fail to support with my economic power, farmers, gardeners, health practitioners, artists, entrepreneurs, builders, craftswomen, and men of my community. And as you know, that is something that has upended our economic viability because Mm -hmm. our, our dollars, our money does not circulate too often within our community. That's the reason why I don't know why these people are so afraid to offer reparations because it will surely beast, boost their economy. You get your trek on Friday night and you can't wait until the banks open, but uh, you can now deposit it and have immediate use of it and it will boost the economy the way even, unfortunately, the COVID, as we stayed home, we spent more money at home um, than we would ordinarily. And so that's amazing to me why they have this problem. They're going to get it right back because of how we are conditioned to try to buy our status with cars and, uh, and um, torn up jeans that cost $250 a pair and sneakers that cost as much as a small car. Um, so that's a, that's a problem. I want to jump in and say and and make a make a few comments on this. First, sure. I want to go back to the people who bleach and straighten their hair and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, to be really brief, I had my first relaxer at thirteen. Mm. I made it very clear to the person who was relaxing my hair that I wanted my hair to continue to grow out of my scalp the way that it does. I made it very clear that I did not want my hair to grow out of my head straight. And she made it clear to me that it won't. And then I asked her, why is it a perm? And she said, just because the hair that gets relaxed is permanently straight, but my hair will grow out of my head the way that it does. So what does what is that cross section of getting the relaxer, but not wanting it to grow out of my head straight? That's the cross section of my parents raising me, my mom wearing an Afro, uh, my, during my formative years and for, I think till middle school, I don't know, but for a significant part of my upbringing and with the intersection of the programming and brainwashing to bolster the creation of white beauty standards for, for everyone. White beauty standards are for white people. They, those are their standards based upon their complexion, their features, their skin color, their hair. That's for them. It's not for us. And it takes uh, a, 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 a brown Jesus that's been that's been made white. It takes Santa Claus. Those are your two savior archetypes. It takes fairy tales with Goldilocks and the lady who was running and she lost Cinderella and Cinderella and 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 just all the fairy tales that my parents didn't read to me. So I'm struggling a little bit to remember, but they were all white women who who fell and got rescued, right? 
we see all these pictures, we have all these models. So it's 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 sound bite, sound bite, sound bite, visual bite, visual bite, visual bite to program you to make you think that your brown skin, to which the sun makes love to your skin when you go to Egypt, because I went and my little caramel complexion was chocolate brown and your girl was fine. Okay. The same thing happened with me. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I didn't burn. It felt great. And I look good. I'm gonna find that picture and post it. Okay. We have hair that is active with the sun. Our hair, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the only thing that I know that grows against gravity up and out and down. And it's natural. Other human beings can't do that. We do that. Why do we get carded at 40 and 50? Okay. So to, to not want that, is because of programming and the programming has to continue because every time a little African child is born, she's bo he or she is born loving themselves because that's natural and instinctive, but it takes consistent, persistent programming to make people not want to love themselves. True. So the next time you look at yourself, you see your features, your hair, whatever, and, and you want to change that, just stop for a moment and, re and say to yourself out loud, that is programming. That is natural. To that is not natural to me to not love what I see. Self-preservation is instinctive. Everything self, everything alive self-preserves to the best of their ability. So mm -hmm. I definitely wanted to, to address that. And I also want to say this, if you ever get a chance to go on a trip to Kemet, bring your shea butter or buy some there and let your hair be natural so that your hair can interact with the sun. Because until that maybe not just that experience, but let me say it in the affirmative, that experience will awaken whatever in you has been put to sleep by this persistent programming and brainwashing. And once you have an experience like that there or someplace else, ain't no going back. It, it, you begin to open up and love yourself and you will realize bleaching and all that is just, it's damaging to the soul. That's true. Okay, give thanks. The second thing, really quick, integration destroyed our economic base mm. with the combination of taking our men out of the home and incarcerating the ones that were not, it, it took, it, it broke up our unit and integration displaced our unit. No one integrates, no one's expected to integrate except for black people. There's no name for it when other people are separate and clustered. We just call it Chinatown, or we call it Little Italy, or we call it Koreatown, or we call it Little Poland, or we call it whatever. But when black people get together, it's a problem. You're segregating, you're, that's racist, this and the third. No, it's de it, is, it is yet again deliberately trying to, to separate and displace our base we are an, a, a, a powerful economic base. We just ain't giving it to ourselves. That's why we don't feel it and don't know it, okay? So mm. working towards recognizing this family unit with the woman and the man and the children living in your community, owning your own buildings and businesses is what we have to get back to. Tuesday talk, we talk about comedic spirituality, African spirituality and Pan-Africanism. And for any of you who know me personally, or you've been watching for three years, you know I'm a Pan-African at my core, okay? So I just wanted to address those two things, be black and proud and get your community back. <laughs> Mike. I would say this too, uh, while you're at it, um, I've, I've always wondered, my father considered himself a Pan-African as he did follow Marcus Garvey. But one of the things that has concerned me, I think the time has come in establishing as uh, Sanjeti has so aptly um, de demonstrated, what I call lingu linguistic uh, uh, sovereignty. And I would like to replace the, the Latin word pan, which means all, with the Kemitic term nebu or nebu, you know, um, which means all in our language. So um, nebu africanu would be nice sound. Um, and when we say pan, I said if we are going to focus on totally being totally it should all be of one cloth. If you're talking about 
recognizing yourself as African wherever you may be on this planet, then why not use a African term? Now, of course, Sanjay is going to say, well, we can trace the word pan thousands of years. Oh, see. <laughs> 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 and he yeah. gonna already have a slide ready. He's like, wait, hold on. I have, oh, I, here's a slide. You're gonna pull out of the yeah. shirt and then, right. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, anyway, listen, let's, let's complete this here. Um, and then the, oh, I will open up for us to just uh, finish. Not do I, uh, not do I uh, feed with my economic power or tides, the treasury of racist businesses or fundamentalist misogynistic religions. That's another, that's a number 35. And um, that's, someone told me that in our community, the church is the biggest business, uh, bigger than anything else that we have in, in, the, in the community. And I, I, I don't know if we can even call, our neighborhoods have been so gentrified, there's no such thing as community anymore, but the church does provide a semblance of communion. Um, which can be called a, a community. And um, so that's something that, um, but what, what are we paying for when we put our money in the tide? The continuity of our brain stain with a, um, with a totally patriarchal concept of deity that denies the balance of the feminine side by side with the masculine as it did exist in our culture. And um, I, all, I have, my concern is this, what I refer to as ecclesiastical polyandry, where our women have three husbands, um, where the one that's left at home watching TV at the football game or basketball game, and she goes to give her soul, and that man with the, with the football is at home, um, looking at TV and at these games, and um, she leaves that one who has her body uh, and goes to give her soul to someone who doesn't look like the one she left at home, and then the one who is telling her that the one who don't look like her husband is going to save her soul um, gets her money. So we have this situation where... Um, there is what I have termed ecclesiastical polyandry. But when the African man speaks about polygamy, everybody starts frauding at the mouth. And of course, the only solution is that he would then partake in polygamy, you know, um, jumping from one bed to the next without any responsibility for what he's just left. So that's something else that, uh, that I think we ought to begin to address because um, it's been destroying our what we whatever semblance of com community and family life that we have, you know, because all of these divided loyalties, you know, that uh, you give your body to one, your soul to another, and your money to another, mm. and meanwhile that one who is looking at TV, when he's working, he's bringing home what's needed to put food in the refrigerator or food on the table. And when you sit and you pray, he is not considered to be the provider. And, right. um, that is also part of the breakdown of the family. So are we almost done here? Um, um, any comments? Yeah, on that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you have 38 and 42 left. 38, yes. Not do I display in my home, school of um, school or place of worship, images of spiritual teachers or prophets contrary to their true cultural, ethnic, or geographical origin. Now that's a biggie right there. And um, so that's something that we ought to um, begin to, to um, also look at because uh, you mentioned, Sashat, um, of Yeshua being, even the name has been changed. You see, people change names in order to own something, okay? He was not Latin, so therefore, why are you calling, why are you calling this prophet who, according to the story, was schooled in his infancy 
in his young years in the Per'ank temples of Kemet. All right? And um, so that's, uh, that's uh, also problematic. Yet, yet if, if those ministers who come into consciousness of the contradiction, if they try to take that picture off the wall, the women in the church would have a fit. And this has happened to more than one preacher who has come into the consciousness at the time for us to show a savior in our own image. And um, we go to this excuse, well, it doesn't matter what color he was. I beg your pardon? When you are being persecuted because of this solar robe that you wear, you're going to tell me it doesn't matter when you have been suffering all types of indignities because of this, um, what we call this fatal skin that we carry? Something has to shift about that. So therefore, that's one of the reasons why that was created in order to have us think about what we're doing by placing an images, images of deity that don't look like us. Because right. it translates down into your everyday life. That's and right. If you doubt me, I, I speak to many entrepreneurs and they say that the most difficult time they have is with some of their own um, customers and some of their own employees. That you know, em employees are not are trained to snap and to salute and to click heels when Massa gives directives. But when their own is the boss, then he has or she has problems getting compliance to what he wants or she wants done. And so many entrepreneurs I've spoken to say the same thing over and over and over. And that's a sickness among us as a people. So therefore, um, and we know that that also comes from the, the, the labels that we have embraced. We have embraced the word black as a, as a thing that covers us all. When the fact is that among the various people who, call, who use that term to... It's, it's, we have just, once again, we have accepted a label that has been placed upon us um, and the, the sound is not in keeping with the kinetic sound for the same energy. And that's what I'm saying. A name that sounds like a gunshot that applies to all of us across the field. And when you look in the dictionary, and I would challenge anyone to go into the dictionary that's on your iPad or in your iPhone and look at the 35 definitions of that word that's spelled B-L-A-C-K. And you will see the most horrendous, especially nowadays, it seems as if someone from, the, um, from January 6th has added some of their definitions to that word. And we wonder why throughout the world, People who are labeled with that sound, with that flat, non-resonant sound, are persecuted. Well, foreigners, people who do not speak English, when they are looking to learn English, they go and they rely on the dictionaries to give the definition of that word. And when they see the terrible definitions given to that word, they hate the word and they, hate, they tend to dislike the people who claim that as an identity, which only tells us how we look. It doesn't tell us who we are. Mm. And I'm saying the time has come for us to, because we have been labeled Negro, we've been labeled the N-word, we've been labeled African-American, we've been labeled Afro this and Afro that. <laughs> but All of we have never claimed a definitive term to call ourselves. Now, uh, Richard King, who wrote the the, the, the seminal work on melanin, he used the term kemur, K-M-U-R. We have Kampuchea. In Cambodia, there's a place known as Kamur, K-M-U-R, or K-A-M-U-R. And we know because we know who migrated to, to Kampuchea, what they call Cambodia. Now you can see their faces on the walls, okay? And so th that's another concern that I have. Meanwhile, the people who have taken a, the opposite definition of the word white, which means pure, <clears throat> all beautiful um, definitions, they are lifted up throughout the world. Meanwhile, the people who embrace the B-L-A-C-K word are put down 
because it's put down in the book that is the Bible of English definitions. And we know that the, word, the English language has spread throughout the world. It is the language of diplomacy nowadays, not Latin or Greek. It's English, whether we like it or not. And therefore, for us to just claim a, 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 a um, and I know that, I know that many of us are invested in the word. But when I've, when I've lectured and I've asked the crowd to say, come, 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 and I then I ask them to say, black, black, black. Um, and I ask, which gives more resonance? Everybody in the hall says, come, gives me more resonance. I'm a musician. I play the guitar. I'm, uh, I write songs. I had a band. And I'm into sounds. I'm into music. And that's why it's, I believe the, the mm-kur was more sung than spoken. And that's the reason why I think we ought to listen to African languages, especially those in the far, from the forest, and copy some of their speech patterns and begin to employ more of the labial construct of this tongue and this hollow thing that we call a mouth to get more energy from our utterances because the metuneter, the merunetcher, as some call it, and I don't argue about the different dialects we use as we reclaim this ancient language, but I'm saying it's time that we show some linguistic sovereignty and find a term to describe all of us because still in that one word that we all cover ourselves with here in the West, we are different tribes and we know that tribalism is part of African culture. It's also part of native culture over here. These nations over here were fighting among themselves as we were in Africa. And that's what made it easy to be conquered there and here. Because those who came and studied us saw who were the stronger ones. Which family was the, the, the better shot with the arrow? They were the ones who got the guns. And the same thing happened on the continent that made it easy for them to play one against the other because of our tribal differences. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with tribalism, but unless we form federations of different tribes, which would be a way to insulate the, the body of, 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 our, of our people into these groups, then we would um, have greater success. But we tend to ignore the fact because nowadays our tribes have become gangs and they do not protect our community. They make the community the victims of their crimes. Okay, because you have on Saturday on every street corner where you see the predominant, um, the, the predominant population is us. And we know, yeah, well, we kill each other mm -hmm. and the others do the same thing. But what is our excuse? Because if we say the BLM, that, that it matters, how come it don't matter among us? And we expect them, them other folks to care. Why should they? if we don't show the same care and concern. You're having a quarrel with a brother on the street corner over a nickel bag, you take out your gat and you pop, and some woman about miles away gets her baby shot in her arms as she's feeding her baby. That's happened more than once in our community. So this is why these, these oracles of Ma'at, these covenants of Ma'at are so important for us to employ because we have to go through, I would call, a ethical rearmament with Ma'atical codes of conduct. And we should have, we are going to have a Ma'at militia to help to report the violations to a council, a Ma'atian council of elders. That is the Ma'atiarchal Ma structure that I am proposing and the uh, Ma'atocratic order that we should be establishing. Otherwise, what are we doing with this divine legacy? if we don't move in that direction. Last but not least, now do I pollute the environment, the nature, the seeds or soil? Mm -hmm. I went to buy some grapes today and I couldn't find any grapes with seeds. They are neutering the very food that you eat because they have another agenda, okay? And they're putting it in the soil with these, um, with what they call the, um, what's happening in, 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 Kemet, in Egypt today, whereby the, the, the silt that made that the bread basket of the then known world, all that silt is now trapped behind the Aswan High Dam 
and they are using chemical fertilizers, which, as you know, is impregnated with gender-bending substances to turn the inclination of our br brothers and sisters from the way in which they were born into something that they're trying to make of themselves. Okay, so that's something that we must address in their reclamation of Ma'atian codes of conduct, Ma'atian codes of ethics, and what they call morals. Okay, and polluting the environment. I see so so you're eating a, a, a piece of uh, chewing gum, you're going to throw the garbage on the floor. That's disrespect of the earth itself. That's disrespect of Geb. If you knew that your ancestors equated this earth with a divine principle that we call Geb, and even the heavens, they are polluting her too. They're polluting her womb with all uh, Elon Musk. You're polluting mama's womb with your, with, with, you're going to Mars, a brother uh, or, or cousin, the way to Mars is to go inside. There you can access what you're trying to access outside. That planet will not serve you because you'll take the same shit that you've created on this earth up there, wherever you go, because your character has been shifted and you haven't learned anything about my art or practicing my art, okay? Because as you know, today we're living in an atmosphere where lies have become truth and truth are treated as lies. So that's the, my um, bit on this, these 42, these comments. At another time, we'll address some others when I come back on your show, on this uh, wonderful, um, and I would like us all to get more people to come and support Tuesday Talk. But this beloved sister spends a lot of her time trying to find people to come on to make this a more edifying program. And each of us who claim this legacy of Ma'at have a responsibility to aid her because she volunteers to do this of her own precious time. And so um, I wish that more of us would become involved. So I'm, that's my charge to all of you. And with that, I go into silence. Do uh, do uh. Do uh, do uh. It's always a little difficult to speak after Baba has spoken because I just want to sit and absorb all of it. But I got a show to host, y'all. <laughs> hmm. So I, I really truly hope that, you know, this is one of the episodes that you re listen to because we had the linguistic, the linguistic component to anything when it comes to our legacy is the proof of what we're, what, what we're discussing in that moment, what we're talking about, uh, that we're the originators of it, because we have the language that literally writes out what it is that we did. So if we're talking about the 42 laws of Ma'at, which are moral charges on how you are supposed to treat yourself and treat, and treat every divine being in nature, and we have a, a linguist, a master linguist, who is mm -hmm. here to prove it basically is what it is. Uh, this is how we're supposed to live. This is one of the most important aspects that, that, um, that African people, that our comedic people brought to this planet, period, and gave to humanity. Take the time to review this Tuesday talk. This will probably go, it's two, we, we've been in it two hours and 30 minutes. Maybe it'll take a few, few more minutes to close. When you're doing learning something online or learning something from a video, take the take a week and maybe one day, every day this week, you listen to 20 to 30 minutes of it and think about that for the day. And over the course of the week, you'll, you'll have been able to kind of absorb what it is that you learn. That's what I do sometimes when I'm really trying to get something, you take it and chop it up and just absorb it piece by piece. Understanding what our ancestors gave us in terms of our moral charge and how to live our life is one of the most important. It's that is a primary uh, component to the foundation of being a comedic practitioner or any or, or practicing any African spiritual system, because there are way more differences than I'm sorry uh, similarities and overlap than differences. Okay, so I just want to leave you with that charge. I also want to thank Session Suit uh, uh, Sanjetti and. Mm -hmm. 
Baba Haru, Akra, Simaj, Say Pata. It's such a pleasure to have both of both of you here to teach from your years of study and wisdom and, and steel, sharpening steel with each other. It was really great to be a part of it. And I thank you for bringing such intellect and a fact-based presentation to the people. So I hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much in the everyone in the, in the chat and everyone who comments and who keeps the conversation going in the questions. Sanjeti and Babahuru, I ask that you stay a little bit when we're backstage so the, the team, the Tuesday Talk team can, can say hello to you, to both of you. And some of them are really excited to speak to you, Baba. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, with that, I, I, I handed the mic over to, to Sanjeti and then Baba Haru. Okay. Um, just real quick. I'm going to zip through things like one or two things in the chat. Uh, someone asked, mm -hmm. uh, how do you say preach in Metal Nature? It is nothing per se to preach as far as like the word. It's more about speaking. So if you were to speak, that would be more like jet. jet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's speak. But in Kemet, they didn't have like, they didn't have the sermon model like we have today. Okay. They have the Sebaite text, which are the wisdom writings, the wisdom text. Mm -hmm. All right. And, you know, you do have priests who and, and parents who are wise, but it, it wasn't the sermon model. So to speak, to teach. So it'll be more so teach. Seba. Seba verb meaning to teach. Seba way. Seba wu teacher. The man. Sebat is the woman teacher. All right. Mm -hmm. So and seba is the origin of the word um Sophia, which is part of the compound word philosophy. Okay. That you find in Greek. All right, so we can get on that another time in detail. And then I'll sing one more thing that I don't want people to get misconstrued. So I made a comment saying that comedic or metal nature is ge'ez. That is incorrect. Okay, that's incorrect because ge'ez is Semitic. The comedic language, they, are, they do not speak a Semitic language. Ge'ez, Amharic, um, uh, Amarina, those languages are, are break off of Southern Semitic, and it's called Ethio-Semitic, okay? So Ge'ez is not, I emphasize, is not Kemetic. The Kemetic people did not speak Ge'ez. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. And it's already been demonstrated by Shekin Tejot, and the Ifala Binga in the early 1970s at a conference, the Cairo Symposium, 1974, that Kemetic, the Egyptian language, and I'm saying Egyptian because that's what they wrote in the book. Um, we go to these works here, the Journal History of Africa, Volume 1, Methodology in African Prehistory, and even going here, Journal History of Africa, Volume 2, Ancient Civilization of Africa, Go there. Um, all these works. This, I pull it down now because you know this this conversation it keeps popping up. This here, this book here, 1993, Theophila Binga. It all demonstrates that Semitic. This one here by John Claude and Boley. Semitic is not Egyptian. Egyptian is not Semitic. Um, we can go here, shake it to Diop. I have a whole litany of books here that disproves that. So there's no Afro-Asiatic. Okay, I'm, I'm real hard on that. There's no Afroasiatic. Afroasiatic is a falsehood. Afroasiatic is fr as a fraud. There is no Afroasiatic language family. It's done. It's been disproved back in the 70s. It's outdated information that modern Egyptologists are keep holding on to. It is false, and we could demonstrate it. We could debate it. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to pump my ego here a little bit. Okay, Pump. anyone that poses that you will lose point blank. Okay, we got to stop it. And, and you know, African, African centered, African centered models. So, here you go. All these books here, all of this. Check into the app. Here's his linguistic book, 1977. He already demonstrated Waloff and Kemetic are in the same language family. That means that Semitic is 
and Afroasiatic model is done. It's a wrap. 1977. It's okay. So stop it. All right. Well, you know, just, just quickly, I'm so happy that you, you mentioned that because Kush, if you accept the Greek term Ethiopia or the Roman term Abyssinia, when the book that you rely on for, for the name says it's a, on the temple walls, it's Kush. And some say Kush. In the Bible, it's spelled C U S H. Others spell it K U S H. But the fact is, how come? that 48% of the people of the land now called Ethiopia are in the house of Shem by way of Christianity. How come 48% of them are in the house of Islam? You know? Okay, because uh, because uh, these things, it's a for, fraud. For, for, from, 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 again, from, uh, from, from the house of Shem, where only 4% are holding on of the o o Oromo, the Omor, the uh, Oromo are uh, celebrating even every year the Erecha festival, which is um, which is the preservation of the festival of Het Heru, where they meet and they pour honey at the root of a sycamore tree on, uh, on the Nile, on the, on the banks of the Nile in in uh, around Lake Tana. So you see. Uh, the, the, the ball was dropped when Izana slaughtered the priests of Amen-Ra and embraced the indoctrination of a Turkish Christian that is now ruling the, um, the land of Kush. So ancestral treason is real even on our continent, okay? Uh, I, I continue to wonder why when our leaders have been jailed, they always come out of the jail in a suit and tie. Kenyatta did it. Um, Mandela did it. Prempe did it. What the heck is the Homburg hat? You're going to wave to an African crowd with a Homburg, and inside your brain is the brain stain that you got while you were imprisoned. Something is wrong. We got to shift that kind of thinking and that kind of ancestral treason. I'm sorry to say that I, if I offend anyone, but you see, at this point in my life, I have to be, my tongue is loose and I'm very honest about how I feel about certain things. So you'll just yeah. have to forgive me if anyone is offended. Okay, Baba. Uh, if I may, uh, okay, 30 second clarity. So Afro-Asiatic is a secular secularization of Hamido-Semitic. Mm. When in the 1800s, when he putting linguistics the field together, when they put Indo-European together, they were very meticulous, they were very thorough. But when it came to African languages, et cetera, they were sloppy. So when they went, they took the Bible, chapter 10, 10 of Genesis, which is the table of nations, they used that to classify languages scientifically. You cannot use the Bible to classify anything scientific. It, yeah. is, un it is unscientific. So they started with Hamido-Semitic. Ham, according to the biblical narrative, is all the African folk, all the African people. And then the Semitic people are the Semitic speakers. And then they realized some of those languages sounded, loosely sounded the same, so they just slapped it together and put Hamido Semitic with no, with, with no rigor. They slapped it together. They slapped it together. So to make themselves feel better, they changed Hamido to Afro. That's all they did. And all the main proponents, be it Joseph Greenberg, Christopher Errett, okay, uh, got, got his work, got his works here too. All right. All these people believe that black people are cursed with and they believe that the advanced people in Africa are dark-skinned Caucasians. We can quote it. That's what they believe. The same people who said who say Afro-Asiatic. I'm talking about the people who put it together, not the minions. Okay, not the people who are just repeating it. I'm talking about the people who put it together, the actual scholars. They believe that these are dark skinned Caucasians, and they say Afro Asiatic, or if you follow Christopher Eric, he says Afrasian, trying to make it sound oh, like it's updated. It's crap. Yeah. It's slapped together. In fact, this book is, is, is like linguistically not that good anyway. Okay, so there is no Afro Asiatic. Okay, the update. 
that Theophile Benga gave, he called it Negro Egyptian, in French, Negro Egyptian. And then we upgraded it from there and call it um, Shinkanda Shikole. Shinkanda Shikulu, excuse me. Shinkala Shikulu, which means the ancient, the most ancient of languages. Mm-hmm. And Kulu is cognate with the word Kemet. And mm-hmm. it's a, basically a, 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 a Bantu translation of Diop's original name for the origin of African languages, which is Proto-African. Mm-hmm. It's a translation of that. The update is Shikala Shikulu. And that's when we're using African terms to define African reality. Besides linguistic sovereignty, great. Okay, linguistic sovereignty. There is no Afroasiatic. Afro, technically African, yeah, it, it, it comes from a North, like a Berber word. Okay, and Asian is actually a Semitic word. Okay, okay. So we're not from the, we're not Eastern per se. That's what Asia means. It comes from but the Catholic word. It means actually. Look, we're about spelling, to be up two hours. <laughs> but hey, the spelling of Asia is A S I A. Sia is penetrating intelligence. The A ah in front of it, like you can be a moral. Okay. Without the in that case, A means without. Could it be that the word that the Greeks used that term, Asia, A Sia, because they knew about Sia. Okay, in our in our uh, legacy, right? What is Sia? Sia is intelligence, knowledge. Okay, and if you are a Sia, you are without knowledge, and that's why the the Greek pre the the Greek um, the the uh, Kemetic priest told Solon that you Greeks are mere children. Okay, because of that, because they were a Sia without proper knowledge. Okay. Well, so I just yeah. wanted to so drop while, that in. Right. So while I agree with with, so, with, with, with the priest said to Solon, oh, you Greeks, you Greeks, you are you have no elders among you. I agree with that part. Mm-hmm. Now, I do disagree with the AC part, but, you know, <laughs> you know how we do. Um, well, you know, that's how I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so hopefully, you know, hey, take that to the bank, y'all. There is no Afro-Asiatic. That's done. Okay. Um. We have updated, upgrade, updated and upgraded information <laughs> that demonstrates the Africanity, the African character, African origin, and pure Africanness of Kemet and mm. relatedness of all these cultures and all these languages. Yeah, it's been demonstrated. And, and we can flood you all night, which is evidence upon evidence. We will never finish. So. No more Abrahamism. Let it go. There, there was no origin of humanity in Mesopotamia. Is that's done? Okay, because that's what the whole Afroasiatic is all about. Dark-skinned Caucasians. Okay, which again is is racist, racist psychopathy. And there's no Adam and Eve. Origin of humanity in Mes- between Tigris and Euphrates River. Okay, yes. that's what all that is all about. So. Again, I respect Ethiopian languages, Ethiosemitic, but Ethiosemitic is a branch of Southern Semitic because Semitic speakers went over and invaded in that part of Africa and brought it. Here you go, Gaiz. It comes from Semitic people who invaded. That's the history. That's it. Well, R. H. Water the Lubix, he took the cake in Sacred Science on page 171 in a footnote. He speaks about the white Negro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, so I just gotta jump in all and right, say right. we know that's a lie. A white Negro, come on, that it don't even okay. make no sense. A white Negro. Right. So, you know, I I want to say thank you for for coming on. We are we are at two hours and forty three minutes. This is like interviewing. Um, let's see, Dr. Ray Higgins can go this long. Dr. Jeffries is go this long, and I should have known <laughs> with uh, with Baba Haru and Sanjeti that it was gonna go this long too. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you guys for coming. For thank you both for being a part of this, and for we still have forty five people watching. We still have a pretty decent Ooh. amount of the original people watching. I guess they took a stretch break, got some hydration, and came right on back. So it sounds like we have a couple of other uh, Tuesday talks to discuss because that topic sounds like it needs to be addressed and dismissed and proven, etc. So we can talk about that sometime soon. So I want to I want to thank both of you for being here. 
both of you are so loved and appreciated and and respected and and like i said at the top of the show please show your your love and support uh, financially with the cash apps i want to thank those of you who sent me some cash apps because i saw the you know little announcements you know going through during the show so thank you so much and um I, do do either of you have any parting words? Sanjeri, I'll give you some parting words. And then Baba Haru, if you could give us a blessing at the end. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming in, uh, for uh, listening and watching with us. Uh, I always say I learn more from y'all than you do from me. And, you know, the feedback, I love the feedback. And, you know, keep learning, keep studying, et cetera. And, you know, I'm here. All right. Thank you. Do I. I just want to remind my listeners that um, how I feed myself, I do not really depend upon cash apps at all. I am grateful for whoever, because most people think because I do uh, sacred sa, which we call, which I call joy ari, that I'm rolling in cash and I'm rolling in gold. And um, the truth is that I would like to see more of you out there promoting the works that are done here at the Studio Pata because this is where you get the authentic emblems. I have to correct many of the so-called cartouches that come out of the land of Egypt because they, many of the merchants really do not know the Metunetter. They do not know what power symbols to use to render some of the names, for instance. And I spent some time correcting those so-called cartouches. So you're welcome to come and get your Shen, your Shenu, um, in your names in, in the sacred... Um, Metuneter and sacred glyphs of our ancestors. So I want to say Amasu in Pa Nkara Sauk Su Ementra Npa Nkara Awu Kwaura Maketi Paherura. Give yourself to the divine, keep yourself daily for the divine, and do it tomorrow as you do it today. That's our interpretation of this ancient prayer. Tuau Ankemaat. Ankh and Ma'at, and we'll see you next Tuesday. To where we're